pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Public for which it stands. <coughs> okay, um, first thing is to approve the agenda. Um, the first thing I'd like to note is that we're going to move item number two up to uh, the head of the list, being that we do have a number of people uh, representing uh, the baseball community, and we'd like to um, hear their pitch, and uh, then they can go on their merry ways, because I know most of them have been putting a lot of time uh, on this project already. So. Um, anything else we want to change or add to the agenda? Can we adjourn right after number two? <laughs> no. Uh, right after one. <laughs> after one, yeah. Okay, if not, I guess I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with changing number two to number uh, head. Second. Second by Mark Bartuschik. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, the agenda is approved. Well, with that in mind, I guess uh, we're going to start with the baseball uh, committee, Mike, are, are, do you want them to, or do you want to lead into it before? Let me give a bit of an overview, and then we'll bring a couple of the uh, committee members up to do the formal presentation for the council tonight. But uh, let me welcome everybody tonight. Uh, it's been a number of months of work by this committee to, to get to this stage, and so I know they're excited to uh, present some recommendations and information to you tonight. So I know they're uh, all very excited to be here. Uh, sitting in the front row is Jerry Plombeck from the Orioles, Tom Weschka from the high school uh, baseball coach, and Mike Stika from uh, the park board and an avid uh, umpire baseball committee member, uh, jack of all trades as I understand it. And sitting behind him is Brian Jurdy, uh, one of the principals from INS, a uh, resident here of New Prague, uh, who has, for the council's benefit, uh, provided all of the planning assistance to the committee and the community for the survey work and all of the planning and mapping that's been done, cost estimating and everything to get us here tonight. He has done this uh, personally and as a member of his firm to assist the community and the baseball community in getting this project this far at least uh, tonight. And he and his firm have donated all of their services to facilitate that. So. Uh, we haven't asked him what that's totaled up to date, but uh, I can only imagine the thousands of dollars that, uh, that they've spent in getting that, plus all of his technical uh, skills and knowledge uh, on field development and reconstruction has been extremely beneficial uh, to the baseball group. I can't remember how many months ago it was that I think uh, Jerry Valerius and Mike uh, Stika came to the council and talked about that uh, they had been awarded the bid for the 2018 State Amateur Baseball Tournament. But uh, that acknowledgement and indication to the council and the community uh, uh, was such that uh, we were being given the opportunity several years down the road to host this uh, statewide baseball tournament. However, it appeared that uh, there would have to be a number of improvements undertaken at our facilities here to ensure that we could meet the standards. And so the work that uh, these gentlemen and a number of others that aren't here, uh, David Brugic has been involved from the council, Glenn from our staff and myself, and some others, uh, I don't have everybody's names out in the audience, but we've got a few more people, and I'll let Mike acknowledge that when he comes up. But uh, uh, we've met, I believe, it's been about seven or eight times since this last October, trying to put together the contents of what you're going to see and hear this evening. And so as they take a look at it, I think the important thing to, to remember as part of the background of this is that uh, uh, the 18 tournament is really just the catalyst for the discussion. Uh, it's not the end all, it's not the, the final product uh, in the sense that we're done, uh, but it was just the catalyst to format this discussion. One of the other bigger parts of this is what was authorized by the council in July as we took a look at this was to begin to attempt to bring together all of the different baseball entities in this community. Uh, again, whether that be the, uh, the amateur ball, the high school baseball, the youth baseball, any of that, trying to take a look at how we could coordinate and break down barriers and uh, move silos and try to begin taking a look at uh, what needs to be done, how does it need to be done, and 
how can these groups effectively move forward into the future by collectively working together on the baseball front versus individually all working on their own little pieces of that. So that, as I said, they've been meeting for the last five months. We've had about seven meetings. Uh, the extensive part of the process was to come back to the council with a list of recommendations on what, uh, number one, what needs to be done, what are the costs, what are the priorities, uh, where might some funding come from, and uh, what would this entire picture look like. So you're going to see the compilation of uh, work that, as I said, has been done over the last five months in about seven meetings with all these different community players. Uh, is it going to answer all your questions? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, all we know is that we're at a critical juncture, juncture as we bring this in that uh, very shortly here we need to engage INS to put together the projects that we're going to do for the summer here of 2015 so that we don't lose this summer or this fall depending upon the timing along with improvements that will need to go on in 2016 and 2017 to hopefully have our baseball facility ready for that state amateur tournament in 2018. So I give you that as a little bit of background and what we're going to provide to you or what we have included in your packet and then I'm going to let Mike and uh, Tom come up and formally go through it along with uh, Brian is you've got a schematic. Uh, Ken, can you bring up the, uh, oh, I suppose you were going to run that from there, Mike. Uh, we'll get started here real, real quick just to kind of show you what we have uh, uh, on, on this facility. Everybody kind of knows the location over there by the golf course and the water plant. But uh, this is an outline of what uh, the proposed new baseball field looks like. We've had discussion on what's formally the right name. Is it the right name? Should it have a different name? Uh, should we do like the Twins did and put it out and hopefully get a, a vendor that would uh, sign up for the naming rights? Uh, so what you see on there tonight is uh, our best uh, illustration for right now is that, uh, you know, I've heard it called the DRS field and a number of other different things, but as we take a look at where it's located and the fact that it's a city-owned facility is that it's the Memorial Park baseball field for purposes of our presentation, no more and no less. Uh, what Mike's also going to touch on, doesn't have to do it right now, is that, uh, and Brian will come up with that after he introduces him, is uh, a listing and delineation of the various elements of improvements that are proposed as part of this baseball improvement, as well as the costs and necessarily what's included. Then Mike will come back and talk about the funding outline on uh, how uh, they're looking or hoping for uh, uh, city, school, private sector, baseball community participation. <coughs> And then last is a little bit of a look of an arrangement that the city of Delano did with their baseball community in trying to finance the uh, local group's contributions over a number of years. So we provide that as just a bit of an outline. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and let uh, him and Brian or Tom come up uh, to start the uh, first part of the process. Yes, uh, just remember uh, to speak into the microphone, please, uh, so that uh, the people who will be viewing this at a later date will uh, you know, understand and be able to clearly uh, hear what you're talking about. So. Sure. Well, to start, I'll kind of go through what the proposed um, improvements are to the field and kind of to start the whole thing off, what we first did was surveyed the entire facility. Um, so we had a, you know, accurate information on how the, the existing facility lays out uh, as well as all the topographic features of the site. Um, with the input of everybody, uh, the, the, the main things that we focused on were um, the amenities and the, the fan experience part of the, the facility as well as the field. And um, as we've kind of uh, showed in the, the graphic that you've got in front of you, what we're proposing <coughs> is to eliminate the existing um, dugouts and uh, press box and restroom concessions building and bring those to the north end of the facility to really make it kind of a front and center showpiece of the facility as well as um, wrap the back of the bleachers uh, with a, a wall to kind of spruce it up and uh, provide an opportunity for some signage and also create some green space uh, behind the bleachers so it kind of softens the look of the facility um, as you're approaching it on Lexington Avenue. Um, so the main entry of the facility would become um, on the north side with the new restroom and concession building uh, that would mimic the new one that the, the school district built out at the new football stadium. Um, 
you know, big part of that is an effort to kind of consolidate the image and provide some consistency between the, the different parts of the community. Um, and, and then beyond that is kind of create a plaza and fan experience area where uh, people can hang out and set up some picnic tables, things like that. Um, families can come and have a snack and watch the game, um, as well as reposition and, and get new dugouts in there, uh, as well as some, uh, we're calling it a check deck, but a, a kind of a, a deck or patio type seating area uh, where people can be engaged right next to the fence and kind of experience the game, the game on a different level than sitting in the bleachers. Um, another major component is where we're creating the new entry and plaza area uh, for everyone familiar with the, the site. That's currently where the batting cages uh, are and we'd reposition those um, along the right field line uh, just beyond the fence kind of next to where the golf cart sh uh, shed is right now um, and out there create the new batting cages, bullpen, storage area for some of the netting and batting cage uh, equipment um, and then beyond that it's um, you know really gets into the field and the field amenities um, the the proposed change there is to uh, regrade and uh, sod the entire f uh, field so that it and so that it drains better and, and is graded to uh, what current standards are for uh, this type of a facility it also would include uh, uh, upgrades to the irrigation system um, that we'd likely tie into the system and controls that are at the the golf course as well. Um, the existing lighting, uh, we spent quite a bit of time taking a look at uh, what options are there. We think we've arrived at the the best option. The existing towers are in good shape. Um, however, the the lighting level that we're getting out of those towers is um, not the greatest so the proposal would be to put new uh, light fixtures on those towers um, and bring the lighting levels up to competition level standards. Um, is there anything I missed? Scoreboard enhancements maybe. The oh, next step next, but yeah some of the, the uh, we're, part of the, the field improvements as well are um, some enhancements to the scoreboard uh, for signage and what was the other? The, and then oh, uh, a new backstop, a new backstop light, uh, netting um, so that it's not the heavy chain link. It's a little more uh, fan friendly. Um, it also um, moves forward from where it currently is by about 10 feet uh, so that we create more room behind the backstop uh, for spectator area uh, and where we we'd propose to put some... Uh, bench seating immediately adjacent to the fence as well for uh, just again getting the the fans closer to the to the action right at the backstop so. um, moving on to the uh, the proposed cost uh, for the all the different improvements um, this is an area where we've spent a lot of time and, and discussion on uh, not only what all we include but also you know how we would break it up uh, one of the things that we really considered in looking at this was um, how can we you know this is a community field so how can we break up the improvements uh, such that we minimize the impact to to the different baseball seasons that that utilize the field um, so what we're proposing is to break up these improvements into three phases with uh, phase one starting in 2015. Um, the main reason the items we have shown um, for 2015 um, are that is to really create and enhance the fan experience. Uh, let's start with getting the community uh, um, some additional <laughs> amenities and some nicer amenities. Uh, so that we can get people more, you know, excited and more people coming to the games, more kids playing the game, um, and just you know, overall create a, a, a more uh, 
exciting experience uh, when you when you visit the facility. So the the concession restroom building is kind of the, the first component to that. Uh, and again, as I described, what we're looking to do is mimic the the one that the school built at the new football stadium. Um, then the kind of the plaza area is the areas you know just surrounding the uh, concession storage building, kind of between the that the concession storage building and the fences. Um, scoreboard. Uh, the main improvements there to add the sponsor panels as well as uh, to digitize the team names. Uh, the grandstand enclosure would be to infill the back so that as you drive up, you've kind of creating we're creating kind of a poster board for uh, the whole facility uh, that can be used, you know, likely for signage for any of the teams uh, that that use the facility as well as. Uh, the potential uh, name of the field if it's something other than um, Memorial Park baseball field. Um, another part is you know because of the improvements for the concession restroom building, we have to relocate the existing batting cages, which are not in a condition that if we re that we couldn't relocate them, so these would be new. Um, and then the the miscellaneous site improvements include things like the demolition of the different uh, dugouts, things that are, are, sorry, the concession building that's there, uh, removing the asphalt and getting utilities, uh, sewer and water services to the um, concession building, things like that. Um, talk about the cost now. Or we can touch on maybe here a little okay. bit if you, I mean, if you want. So kind of the, the grand total of those things is um, and we're, we're looking at the costs from the standpoint of, uh, you know, we were to advertise this project like a, a typical uh, city project. We go out to public bid for it. So the costs we're, we're looking at that we've included in this are really, um, if we were to publicly bid it um, and not factoring in, um, there's, there's a good potential that, you know, contractors and people from the community might be willing to donate, but we can't rely on that so you know the numbers we're, we're, in, we're using right now are assuming that um, you know we'd hire a contractor and it'd be built like any other city project so the the phase one improvements uh, total uh, about 342,000 um, of which um, based on some of the things that we think the the different entities that have been involved in this uh, there's about 20,000 of that that we think is very easily done as a uh, in-kind work. Um, there's certainly potential beyond that, but uh, conservatively, we, we feel $20,000 is very doable as a in-kind for the, the phase one improvements. Uh, phase two, uh, the, the main components of that are uh, new lighting. Uh, the existing field has... Uh, what 13 foot candle lighting level in the infield and nine foot candle level in the outfield the new lighting would bring that up to 50 foot candles in the infield and 30 foot candles in the outfield which is a competition level um, level of lighting um, and then again there's some uh, miscellaneous site improvements there are just uh, some of the removals and things that would be associated with creating the bullpens and removing the old lights, things like that. Uh, the, the costs on those uh, total about $125,000, um, of which uh, about $25,000 we're confident we, th we can get accomplished with some in-kind uh, work and contributions. And then the, the phase three work is um, largely centered around the, the improvements to the field. So again, kind of all the things building up right now are kind of first increase the, uh, the fan amenities and the 2017 improvements would be to uh, increase the, the playing surface and the, the player amenities. So the first item there is to regrade um, and get improved drainage in the uh, on the entire field 
infield and outfield, as well as to remove and replace the existing irrigation system. Um, also, new dugouts for both home and away with a press box uh, located on top of the uh, visitors, or home dugout, sorry. Yep. Um, and then, you know, part of that is uh, create, you know, moving the back stuff stop up a little bit and um, putting a knee board on it and, and, and new netting above. Um, and then all new fencing on the back, so the backstop and then the, both the left field and right field line. So the only fencing that would remain is the outfield fence. Um, and again, they're just miscellaneous site improvements to uh, create tie-ins around the edges of where we're doing the work and things like that. Uh, total of that, uh, phase three work totals about 490000 of which we're pretty confident 55,000 of that can be handled with uh, private and in-kind donations. Um, the grand total of everything comes up to about 957,500, um, of which the group's confident that 100,000 of that can be accomplished with in-kind work. So. Any questions? Any questions on Brian's piece at all before I jump in? Regarding the fence that is on the exterior of the field now, uh, is that going to be replaced? The outer ring? Yeah. I guess my concern is, if you know, if we do a lot of the work in that, you know, let's say this fall, you know, you want to be able to lock that facility up so that obviously you don't have people using it as a dog park and you know which I've seen done so I, I'm just wondering you know, you know how are you planning to you know get it so that it will be a secure you know once you get those new buildings in there and, 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 and that sort of thing the, the 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 fencing would stay intact for the most part and we'd we'd only modify as necessary and probably make some more temporary connections until the next phase kind of carries that forward to the the final year. We'll incorporate all the the final changes, but I, my I, we haven't really discussed in a lot of detail. But um, it would the the intent would be to to maintain the security of the facility, uh, with the understanding that parts of it might be a little bit temporary in nature. Um, you know, not the fence might not be in the ideal condition, and we got to jog it a little to to connect it back to a corner of a building or something, but that we'd be able to maintain uh, security through through the whole process. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Go ahead. I was looking at the um, batting cages uh, in the home bullpen, and in particular where the um, portable batting cages, it looks like it cuts right into that cart path that goes out to the driving range for the golf course. I'm wondering about that. Yeah, on, on that, it's that's something that we can, it's it's not set in stone by any means. The, the main thing we were demonstrating there was just the um, creating an area right now that that uh, portable batting cage gets rolled in and out and there's not really a good spot for it. Um, and uh, to be honest, when we laid this out, we don't have the exact dimensions of the one currently being used, so we we're very generous uh, for drawing our drawing purposes for what we need there. Um, as we advance the design, we'll refine that more to minimize any impact to the, the cart path or any of that area. Okay, thank you. There's also a building there right now. Yeah, there, I was thinking that too. <laughs> Which we've had discussion, and I think we want to come back and continue to revisit that one some more. Uh, Glenn is recommending that we take a look at whether we reface that and how we work down in that area, but we've not gone into the intricate design that uh, they've tried to keep this generally at high level, big picture, general format at this stage of the game before we actually move into more of the finite design, as Brian alluded to. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, Mike, go ahead and proceed. Before I get going here, I just wanted to thank Brian for all of his time again. It's been paramount to this project, and 
couldn't have been this far without him. So again, I just wanted to, to thank him and, and his firm as well. So you see the number in front of you tonight, the 957.5, and the question probably simply becomes how will this group pay for it? And before I get into that number and, and paying for it, I just want to say that this community is a strong baseball community, not only in New Prague, <coughs> but the surrounding New Prague area. And as we're jumping into this project, we found that the collaborative effort of the group was, was paramount as well to the, uh, to the vision of this entire project. And so as we kind of begin looking at these numbers, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware that this community is strong uh, with that baseball outreach, and we look forward to having a lot of involvement in this project from the community. With that, um, on the screen now is kind of the proposed funding of this project. And um, as we jump in here, I'm going to kind of move around a little bit. The first number you see is the city is $500,000, and I'm going to let Mike speak to the detail behind that. Um, but as we move down the page, um, I'll quickly go to a high-level um, synopsis of this, and I'll jump into the details. The private baseball groups of that would be the New Prague Orioles, the New Prague Youth Baseball Group, and our committee as it is now. We were proposing to bring back $133,500 to this project to be paid back over a seven-year period. I'll get into those details below as well. Um, furthermore, the school, um, this is all proposed and to be approved by their board in, in May, but at this point in time, they've given us the okay to work with a number of $105,000. They, um, they are a user group of the facility for the high school season for both the varsity and junior varsity. Tom is the, the head varsity coach here. Um, so they're an active member of this funding component as well. Furthermore, um, New Prague Utilities Commission, we met with them last week and they've promised to give 55000 uh, upwards of 75000 as well, um, and that's kind of um, TBD as far as what works out in the end here, but they've approved that component of funding as well. So when all those pieces are added up, that's around seven ninety three five, dollars um, and, and we'll get into some more of the details below, but um, I want to quickly just jump down the page to kind of explain how the private baseball groups would, would bring that one thirty three five dollars back over seven years. So in the bottom of the page here, we have the baseball group's private contributions. The first subtotal there is $28,500. The New Prague Orioles, sorry. Uh, oh, can you flip page. to that bottom of that page? There you go. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. The New Prague Orioles, the amateur baseball team here, um, have promised to bring $18,000 uh, over seven years payable back to this project. Furthermore, New Prague Youth Baseball Association, which has baseball opportunities for 10U all the way through um, American Legion Baseball, has promised to bring back $10,500 over seven years as well. So that's the subtotal of $28,500. Beyond that, once we get into the operation um, component of this field, uh, there are things that we, we can do for the field to pay us back, if you will. One of those being the 2018 uh, Minnesota Amateur Baseball State Tournament. Uh, in the past, many cities who've hosted have, have had a myriad of profit ranges, um, anywhere from $30,000 to $50,000. We are putting in this proposal that from that tournament, we would pay back $25,000 from profits from that tournament. Beyond that, the field, as I mentioned, will, will be having um, opportunity for people to come, and with that, our scoreboard advertisements. So our group would work to find and solidify uh, sponsors to have sponsor panels on the scoreboard. Part of that cost was built into what Brian was mentioning before. And we'd have um, different arrangements with local companies to have advertising. And with that, we would bring $25,000 back uh, in this project. So the operation and advertising subtotal is $50,000. The next piece, is what we're kind of promising to go out and do on our own uh, as a committee, as a group, as a baseball community. These are, as you think of, mostly kind of like the fundraising components, how we're going to actually do this. So uh, one piece on here is a private donation. Um, we've had some conversations, some real light conversations with different folks, and um, one local donor in particular has mentioned the, the promise, or not the promise, but has mentioned the feasibility of providing $20,000 towards this project. He'd be a person we would have more feasibility discussions with if it progresses, obviously. Furthermore, um, we're offering to try and secure $15,000 from different community groups. Um, think of them as kind of those many rooted community groups. We don't want to mention them by name, per se, because we haven't talked to them, but we can all think of different groups in this area um, that we would try and reach out to. 
Furthermore, um, fundraisers, raffles, those sorts of things, uh, whether it be ATV, boats, trucks, that sort of thing, just to generate that, that interest and kind of um, that ability to raise funds. Furthermore, looking at private businesses and private individual fundraising of $10,000, um, all this kind of equates to $55,000. How that shakes out in the end, what the different pushes and takes will be, are to be determined, but our committee would work to ensure that we're um, doing the right things over the next seven years to raise those $55,000. So all three of those components combined from the private baseball groups equate to 1335. And we're proposing um, a seven-year payback schedule beginning at the end of December of uh, 2016, and the different amounts are outlined there for our payback. This is kind of similar to what um, the city of Delano did uh, last spring. A lot of us went up there and visited with them, and they kind of had a similar payback schedule from their private baseball groups. On the bottom, a quick note, um, any funds that we would raise beyond this amount, this committee would, would put back into the coffers, if you will, to, to um, improve other amenities of the ballpark. We wouldn't just be keeping those funds by any means. This would be an effort to, to go right back into the ballpark. In, in a sense, what our committee is doing is creating kind of a group to own um, improvement and improvement um, discussions amongst the baseball groups and more importantly with the city. That's something that I think in the past has maybe not been as robust as it should have been, but I think we have the kind of a, a new beginning, if you will, for all the partners involved in this. I'd just like to <clears throat> echo kind of what Mike just mentioned in, in terms of a collaborative effort, and Brian referred to it too, uh, and we have several people in the audience. I believe we have a couple people from the State Amateur Board um, here this evening as well, so I'd like to personally thank them for coming. We do appreciate their support behind this as well. Uh, we look at it really from a couple different viewpoints. One, it is a major facility within the city of New Prague that is really part of the central focus of, for sure, that part of the city when you have the golf course there, uh, the pool where it is currently located, um, and just that, that's kind of a very active area. So that, that's one piece. For me personally, uh, as a head baseball coach at the high school and really working with, you know, all the way down to t-ball kids in the summer through the, the city and, and uh, school cooperative that we've done for many years now, um, this is something that I think the whole baseball community, but the whole community in general can benefit from. And the list of people that have been a part of the stadium committee so far, I think really presents itself to a wide range of people, people that have been in the New Prague community uh, for years, people that are maybe new to the community, um, with one goal in mind is to improve the facility, also improve the baseball aspect of it. For me as a, as a head coach, the instructional piece with the batting cages to the ability to use that facility as a high school program, as a youth program, and then obviously all the way to an amateur program uh, that Jerry is currently managing with the Orioles. But look around our entire school district and our communities that surround us, and, and baseball is really an intricate part of, of what people do during the summer. Um, and I think we've brought many people to the table uh, to come to you tonight with this proposal, and we, we appreciate you, first, the support that you've given us prior to this, and then giving us the opportunity to kind of lay this plan in, in front of you. So thank you for the opportunity to do this from our committee and in, in a representative way of the entire community. If you don't mind, I won't mind reading the names off just so they can <laughs> have some, uh, some glory, if you will, for all their time and help this, this fall. Tony Boothy. Uh, from the school, Tom Wetschke, as I mentioned, Brad Skogerbo, Nick Scheneker, Jerry Planbeck, Dave Iverson was there, Sean O'Neill, Dan O'Brien, Jerry Valerius, Larry Kotek, Roman Rosinski, myself, Brian Jurdy, and Andy Brandle from INS, um, Mike Johnson, Glenn Stika, um, Dave Brujic, Jim Caligiri, and Ch uh, Mayor Nikolai was there as well. Um, and also tonight, quickly, Mark Forsman and Joe Krieger from the State Board are here as well, just as, as Tom mentioned as well. But um, thanks to those guys for their time and effort in getting this far. We really appreciate that. Did you want to? It looks like they've left just a little piece to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been a fun process. Crossing, and, uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's, is but, that what uh, you're saying? 
Yeah, the, they, they did all the hard work trying to figure out what the costs were and the priorities and what was needed. Uh, then they turned to me and said, well, what can we do to uh, raise the cash needed to do this? And obviously one of the challenges is that this is a city facility and, you know, it's been around for uh, going back how far, I think, uh, we tried to talk about uh, 1951. Uh, obviously I wasn't around then, and so it's been a major community facility. Uh, I don't know as we did our homework and took a look at this that there's been significant capital investments by the city over the years and as we've grown from a community uh, going back in the, the late 1990s, early 2000s from a little community of uh, 3,000 to, to now about 7,500 and you look at the continued residential growth and development that we have on the table, albeit not quite as fast as what we encountered in the uh, early to mid-2000s, but still projected uh, as you looked down the road to a community that could grow to very easily the 10 to 12,000 population size, if you remember the comprehensive planning that uh, Ken has done. So we tried to take a look at it as how can we do this, you know, within some reasonable format. And so on page four of the materials you have in your packet, as well as what uh, Mike has up on the drawing board there, is try to take a look at how might I be able to put this together at least to give you something to uh, roll around in your minds and to, to take a stab at it. And uh, as you recall er earlier this year that as we were taking a look at our year-end uh, operations for 2014 that we had a good year as far as revenues over expenditures and I asked you to take an action already to uh, earmark some of that general fund carryover that we ended up with on the positive side to the tune of $100,000 that you've already set aside in a project account. In preparations of the 2015 budget, uh, we programmed in a capital expenditure in the parks area to be uh, earmarked to this project to the tune of about 110,000 here in 2015. Uh, I'll come back to the 90,000 piece, but if you look at the 16 and 17, the assumption in what you see in front of you that I've put together is the continuation to include in the capital expenditure realm of the parks budget another hundred thousand dollars in 16 and a hundred thousand in 17 uh, to continue what you've got programmed here in 15 for the next couple of years and then finally to get to that half million mark is that we've got a discretionary fund that's available for council usage uh, called fund 499 that we've used for various transportation trail projects and other things and you know that's a fund that we could take a look at using uh, or we still have some additional general fund capital dollars that we could use in our discretionary but uh, for purposes of putting this together try to put it at about 90,000 from this year to be able to tackle the first year of improvements that are estimated uh, uh, at I believe it's what about $325,000 for this first year. So that funding as we put that together and if need be p could potentially be upfronted uh, uh, or if it comes in as we've got it laid out based on the projects it should mirror that process fairly well based on what's scheduled here in 15 and what's proposed for 2016. Uh, the issue we'd have to spend a little bit of time looking at is uh, assembling if the council were likely to concur and commit to participating with the uh, baseball community here on some type of uh, no interest loan that uh, obviously you could do it with some interest but uh, they're out raising community dollars and if we had a way to upfront some monies to cash flow their contributions that's a choice obviously you would make but it appeared at least in the city of Delano it worked quite well for them uh, uh, albeit they had a formal not-for-profit organization that was created uh, we've probably got an ad hoc group of uh, uh, different uh, entities and uh, uh, I'm not quite certain that I have the answer as to who we would enter into an agreement with but the the concept is what is shown under the uh, city of Delano materials um, the same way with the piece that uh, Mike alluded to the school has not taken a final position or acted on anything at this point and we're we're proposing to them or as we've tried to create this in conjunction with some preliminary discussions is that would also be a seven-year lease on the facility for the the school district uh, I believe they participate in various arrangements from uh, uh, swimming arrangements down in Montgomery to the gymnastics to the hockey and so they have a number of other things uh, they have a, a little bit more of an important issue that they're getting ready for here on May 5th and so they really didn't want to entertain the discussion and interaction that until uh, that issue is completed so what it would mean is that we've got to take a look at somehow the school piece and the community piece probably finding a way to cash flow those uh, in order to undertake the improvements in 2017 or obviously we wouldn't be ready for 2018 and 
I think there's a hope and a belief, and I, I don't know that Mike touched on is that there's still a gap in there, a little bit of about 64,000. Um, he doesn't have that placed on the uh, uh, the baseball committee side of the equation, but I know through our discussions is that the uh, intent would be is that we work very strongly with the baseball community and in their fundraising to try to generate that privately, if at all possible, uh, but recognizing that uh, as you put this together and as you take a look at it is that we've got that gap and we've got to cover some interim cash flow in here is that with it being the city facility, they're probably looking to you and or to the city to help facilitate some of that. So the first two years appear to be fairly easy to get to, uh, but in order to have enough cash, uh, so to speak, to pay expenses in the, the third year, 2017, uh, we're probably going to have to find a way to upfront some of those contributions unless they do just an outstanding exceptional job and everybody jumps on board and all the cash comes in quicker, uh, then, then that would be great. But I'm not expecting that that's probably going to occur. So we've tried to put together, or I did on behalf of the city, taking a look at uh, um, how we could generate the city's share of this that uh, obviously when you look at the mix is that there's a combination trying to uh, uh, provide... Uh, uh, some contributions from not just the city, i.e. hopefully the school, if they concur and participate, uh, the utilities on the lighting and then the baseball community with a number of other elements in here, is, is trying to find a fairly uh, wide uh, area of support throughout the community and the immediate area to, uh, to try to undertake this improvement. Uh, um, the, the one donation with very little work and a phone call is that I think uh, we'd have that one in the bank tomorrow if we if we asked. So it's kind of uncertain and they're, uh, they're being a little bit cautious as they come to you with this proposal that, uh, you know, this is new for them and all of us to try to go out and do this uh, versus uh, asking us just to take care of 100% of the facility improvement, uh, which would probably be a little bit more of a tougher sell and a little bit more difficulty uh, in how we might be able to finance that. So. The plan you have in front of you is one that I think is uh, fairly workable, doesn't result in any major tax increases. We've got it in this year's budget, and uh, you know, looking ahead to the next couple of years, it ends up being one of the capital priorities in the overall capital budget that the council would consider, but something that I think is fairly doable and workable. But uh, again, I don't have the authority to commit the city to that, that only the council can, but it lays out uh, what we would have to be looking at in the next couple of years to try to undertake uh, an overall facility improvement or renovation of the magnitude that's uh, been described for you here this evening. So uh, that I think I've already touched on the agreement from Delano that that's in just as an example to kind of show you what they did. And uh, I think it's with that, Mike, uh, you and the committee would uh, stand for questions. Any questions from the council to the committee or, or to Mike on uh, any of the financing or any of the options or I have one Go ahead. what are we supposed to come up with tonight just uh, a, a, well, the, a what's your, what's your we, action tonight is yeah. essentially whether you're conceptually willing to approve the yeah. outline of what's being presented to yeah. you with the acknowledgement that we would probably move forward with the preparation of the plan preparation for the 2015 improvements um, that, that assumes that you have enough of a comfort level as you look at uh, all of the materials that are in front of you. But if we're going to be ready, and from a timing standpoint, uh, Brian needs some lead time to be able to uh, finalize preparation of plans. He'd probably put the contract in front of us to do the design work for the phase one improvements. Uh, we'd bring that back before you, get that approved. Uh, he'd proceed with the design so that we can get that publicly bid out for that work to begin occurring probably sometime in the latter part of August, I think, is what you're thinking. Um, uh, Mid-August, mid uh, mid-August, so that we've got that September and October to try to undertake a number of those improvements. When you look at the private in-kind donations, uh, you know, that's including city workforce. Uh, Glenn is the public works director working with our street crew, trying to work with some of the local contractors, uh, trying to work with uh, community support that when it comes time to go out and do the demolition, that's where we're trying to pick up some of those in-kind pieces or marshalling uh, in-force uh, crews uh, to be able to assist in that process. So uh, the, the first year would be undertaking those improvements and then recognizing that you're going to have to be looking at this every single year as we come forward. Uh, it also would give the uh, 
uh, go ahead to have Brian design some of the materials needed to put in the hands of the committee so that they can actually go out and begin to start doing some of the fundraising and to attacking that process because uh, it's going to take a lot of uh, uh, legs on the ground, a lot of phone calling, a lot of meetings trying to facilitate uh, getting these contributions uh, developed and uh, uh, vendors and other people that would be participants uh, getting that ball rolling for that process. So with the city's commitment, as you take a look at it, uh, that I've got identified, uh, you know, with the amount that you've set aside already, the 15 piece that's budgeted, and a contribution from the capital projects funds, we've essentially got uh, enough to take a look at the first year's improvements, uh, so to speak. Uh, the second year, just conceptually to give you an idea, would be the uh, 2016 capital improvement uh, along with the utilities contribution on the lighting that at least of what's phased it right now, that allows us to take on the first couple of years. And then it's working to raise the other levels of funding to bring in for year three uh, along with figuring out how we would work with them to put together an agreement assuming you're inclined to want to provide some type of front-end loan that they would pay off over a number of years here to bring in the balance of the funding to do this project. All with the goal and the hope that we're done in 2017 so that come 2018 in the spring and early summer is that we're doing all of the final touches, uh, all of the cosmetic touch-up that needs to be done to get ready for that 18 uh, amateur tournament in uh, August of that year. Go ahead, Pat. Are there any grants for this at all? No. <laughs> Not no. that I know of. Okay. Uh, that grant work is, I think, beating the bushes to, uh, you know, uh, some of the the more popular individuals or businesses that uh, we could garner. But uh, there's nothing that uh, that I know of right now personally that we can say that we could go after that uh, uh, would be able to help us undertake this improvement. In many cases, you see communities uh, do the work that we're proposing to do in three years is done over a 10, 15, 20, 25 year time period. We're essentially trying to do a makeover or a renovation in three short years. And then I have one more question. Are you comfortable with the money, you know, with the whole thing you're asking us to be comfortable with? Are you, uh, I've spent your, a lot of, with your I've, expertise? I've spent a lot of nights agonizing over this and uh, the, the city's piece I can come up with uh, the school piece will know in a couple of months about their piece. As we take a look at uh, what the business community and what these gentlemen and ladies can do from within the baseball community, that's probably the one unknown. And so as you take a look at this, if we as a city commit to this, and you know, most of the communities that I've been involved with or have seen that have done things in the baseball arena, or you look at what the school did in taking on the renovation of the uh, football field here in uh, New Prague, I'm reasonably and fairly confident that the private sector will come to the table to support this uh, if the contributions from the city and the school and the utilities are at the table. That's almost uh, too much of a gift horse to look in the mouth to, to not find a way to make it work. And so from the city's piece, I'm confident with the city's piece being able to do that, um, that we can generate those funds without causing any major significant tax increase or any financial uh, problems for the city uh, spread out over a couple of years. The, the piece that uh, we obviously need to work on is how much of the funds that are privately to be raised can be raised versus how much are we going to actually have to uh, cash flow up front. And, and within that, uh, you're looking at most probably the outside of a couple hundred thousand dollars, and that probably could be a loan from the general fund to this project uh, with repayments coming from that as they come in. So it, it's all doable and workable. and. Uh, I wouldn't have laid it out and worked with the committee to the extent that I have if I didn't feel comfortable with kind of where we're generally at at this point in time. Any other questions? I don't have a question. I have a co uh, comment, if you will. I've worked with this group from the beginning, and I'm very impressed with all the effort that they have put in, including, I don't want to exclude Mike Glenn, and other members of the staff. But I've not seen this kind of commitment very often in this community. So I'm impressed with what they can do. One of the things that I think we are not uh, showing here is that the commitment that we will expect and we will get from the community at large. Many times when you do a, a large project like this, the beautification of something brings out 
a lot of pride in the community. And whereas Mike got a $20,000 pledge from one person, when you look at what Mike was able to do with one conversation, I have no doubt but whether we're going to see a much more major contribution, either work in kind or money donations up front to help this out. One of the reasons Brian Jurdy put down doing the amenities first rather than the field, and there was a lot of discussion about that at one of the last meetings as to which way should we go. Do we do the field first or do we do the, the amenities first? And Brian pretty much sold us on, let's do the amenities to get the community involved and let's show them what this place is going to look like. I believe once that's done, at the end of this year, we're going to have, we're going to see a lot more commitment by the community. So I would agree with Mike. I think this is a very doable project. How much we're going to get from each entity, we don't know. But I think it's very doable. Furthermore, and thanks to you for that. Furthermore, um, as Mike alluded to, there is no one core group per se, but the different entities, the different groups that have come together have talked about formalizing a more core group, um, if you will, um, so we can have that centralization of planning and centralization of funds that are coming in um, so that it is more of a one entity group. And beyond that, I mean, to a man, the, the folks that have been, are involved in this committee to Dave's point, I think we're all super involved. We're all uh, understanding the, the degree of what we're getting ourselves into, if you will. And uh, we all want to see this succeed. And I think um, the members of this committee um, are, are good standing citizens, if you will. And we're kind of bringing ourselves to the forefront of this project. And we'll work tirelessly, tirelessly to ensure that it's completed and completed well. Um, it's kind of a reflection of us and our, and our groups as well. So speaking for myself and others, if you'll, if you'll let me, that's our, our goal, to do as best of a job as we possibly can going forward. Any other comments? I guess, you know, I would like to just add my little two cents worth. Um, you know, first, you know, I agree with what Mike said. Is there really hasn't been a lot done to that field since I can remember. I know the Orioles have done some work on their own, uh, redoing the infield and, and trying to do some things like that. But overall, um, to that facility, there, there really hasn't been a lot of money spent by the city on that facility. Uh, and we have to look at it. It is an asset to our community. And uh, just like any other asset, you know, you, you do have to, uh, to keep its value. You do need to upgrade it. Um, I want to thank the committee uh, for the hard work. Uh, Brian, your, your organization, I appreciate that. Uh, from the, on behalf of the city, I want to thank you guys all for the time. Uh, I think you've come up with a very feasible plan, in my opinion. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that it will be successful. And uh, I think it's uh, not only going to be a, a great facility going into the future, but I think it's also going to actually uh, grow the, the baseball enthusiast back into the community. Uh, you know, New Prague has always been a very proud uh, baseball town, and I think uh, it's been kind of disjointed uh, the last few years. Uh, and, and I think something like this is really going to unify uh, the community in regards to that and, and really solidify that, you know, baseball is still a very positive uh, activity and, and sponsorship of, of the community. So thank you guys for doing that. Any other comments? Nobody's got any other comments. I'll move that we approve the adoption of recommendation number two. Second. Okay, I have a motion on the floor that we're going to uh, Approved uh, number two, which basically is moving forward with the uh, committee's recommendation. Um, and uh, I got a second by Amy Jurek. Uh, is there any further comment? If not, I guess all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, passes 5 0. Gentlemen, thank you for your hard work and looking forward to not only seeing how it goes, but uh, definitely I'd like to help out too. We'll keep you posted. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank Thanks. you all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Grab your golf cart over there.
Yeah, yeah, I can drive my golf cart over and watch how you, well you're doing. But. You need some good supervis project supervisors. Yeah. No, he doesn't <laughs> no. get to supervise. He's going to do something. You should do some in-kind work. Yeah. Oh, there'll be a lot Tr of that. Trust me, they've you seen know. my in-kind work. They probably won't want me doing any of that. <laughs> okay, next on the agenda, uh, we are going to uh, start with uh, the cable television franchise. Uh, we have with us today uh, Bob Vos, uh, who is working on behalf of the city on the cable uh, thing. And before the public hearing, Bob would like to say a few words, and then we'll open the uh, meeting up for the... Bob, they're not leaving because they don't like you. And, uh. <laughs> but uh. yeah, Mayor and Council, if I can say, um, that is a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, but I'm going to try. Uh, yes, Bob Vos, Kennedy and Graven. I was saying to the mayor that I office next to Scott and he extends his uh, good wishes tonight, but he's not our cable guy. I'm the cable guy and this is a cable franchising matter. And I just, uh, as the mayor said, wanted to say a couple of things. I'm not sure that we'll have any public comment, but I, I wanted to touch on three things um, for context uh, before you open up your, your public hearing. First, just about what franchises are. We're going to talk about your Comcast uh, franchise a little bit. Secondly, what's going on with your cable franchises? And then thirdly, why you're having uh, a hearing at all tonight. So first of all, about a franchise. Uh, franchises are, uh, in the city business, unusual documents. They're unusual because they're really two things. They're both an ordinance. Cable franchises are adopted by cities as ordinances. And they contain traditional regulatory ordinance type uh, provisions, provisions that say, cable company, you will bury your lines within X period of time. You will pay permit fees to use the right of way. Uh, you will uh, provide insurance, um, a variety of regulatory uh, commitments that are traditional ordinance commitments. They're also, though, contracts, they're agreements. Uh, and they contain uh, straight up consideration, benefits for your community that are not regulatory in nature. They're simply uh, benefits that cable operators uh, supply. The most obvious of that would be the franchise fee. Of course, you're paid uh, by your two uh, operators uh, for the right to do business in town. And let me make one quick caveat. We're here to talk about Comcast, and I'll explain why in a second. But the, the fact that this city has two cable operators, two companies that provide video service, is, um, if not unusual, probably <coughs> extraordinary. Uh, I, I have done uh, work for uh, a lot of cities around the state of Minnesota, and you're not totally unique, but you're almost unique in having uh, cable video competition. So congratulations for that. I think that probably is something you should keep in your minds because it certainly impacts how you want to deal with uh, cable uh, television matters. The folks here in this town have a choice. Most people don't have a choice, a meaningful choice uh, in video operators. So that, that's what a cable franchise is. What's going on with uh, uh, your franchises, uh, plural, um, is that both the BevCom and the, the Comcast franchises are expiring uh, quite soon. Uh, Comcast in, I want to say, mid-April, and then BevCom in May. And that's important because cable franchise renewals, although one should think of them as contract renegotiations, they're a little bit more complicated than that because of the dual nature of them, regulatory and benefits for the community, one. And two, this is way afield and I won't talk about it for more in a second, there is a federal statutory scheme that governs the way cities renew these cable franchises. It's a bit like union contracts. And so there's a lot of process involved, more process than, in my opinion, is required. Uh, but that, that complicates the way that uh, cable franchises get renewed. So in the midst of uh, um, Mike and I uh, starting the process of getting ready to work on renewal of your two franchises last year, um, we learned that Comcast was going to undergo what is a huge change for the whole cable industry. Comcast is uh, buying, it's being called a merger, but they are buying Time Warner. Comcast is the largest cable company in the country, possibly in the world. Uh, Time Warner is the second largest cable operator uh, in the United States. So the combination of those two companies makes a really, really big telecommunications company, big enough that it raises antitrust concerns. The Department of Justice, the FCC, and a variety of other federal agencies have to approve that merger. And so because the two companies saw that how big they were getting was going to raise antitrust concerns, Comcast back beginning of last year said, we promise if you let us do this deal, let us buy Time Warner, we'll spin off, we'll get rid of 
a lot of customers, a lot of systems around the company, enough to keep us below a certain threshold that we think you, federal government, are concerned about. So they made that commitment when they announced they were going to buy Time Warner. They then announced not too long after that that we were the, one of the lucky uh, states being spun off from Comcast. And I say that tongue-in-cheek. I'm not sure that you're a lucky community or that the state of Minnesota is a lucky state in being spun off from Comcast. We're being spun off, uh, though, uh, to a new company that Comcast formed to receive these systems that it wants to spin off. It's going to be called, it's had a lot of different names as we've gone through this, but the, the name I think that's going to stick is Great Land Connections. That would be the company uh, that would receive uh, your system and all of Comcast's systems in Minnesota uh, if this deal moves forward. Uh, one other aside about that, uh, that, that is the focal point of what we're here to talk about tonight, Comcast's desire to spin off its system here to Great Land Connections and all of its systems in Minnesota. When that happens, that requires your consent, the local government's consent. Again, you have a ordinance but also a contract with Comcast. You're a party to that contract, and so for them to reassign the contract, you've got to consent to it. They have come to you some months ago and asked for consent to assign your system and your franchise to Great Land. And so that is the narrowest issue that is b before you tonight. When that happens, cities look at three things. Essentially, they, they look at more than three things, but essentially the three things we look at are the qualifications, legal, technical, and financial qualifications of the proposed transferee of, of Great Land Connections. Uh, and that, that has been done. We, we Mike, I, and, and other folks on your behalf have looked at Great Land, uh, and uh, I want to report on that. I won't do that right this moment, but I want to report on, on uh, our view about uh, Great Land Connections. So then the third thing I wanted to say prefatory to your hearing is why are you having a hearing? And that, that is driven uh, uh, exclusively by your <laughs> charter, by your city charter. Your charter uh, provides that prior to issuing a franchise, uh, you will have a public hearing. It goes on to say um, if you're renewing a franchise, we're not doing that tonight, or modifying a franchise, we are potentially doing that uh, tonight. Uh, I have negotiated with Comcast and with Greatland some benefits, some changes to the current relationship uh, for you. And so to the extent you were to approve that, that would be arguably a modification of the current Comcast franchise, thus the need for the hearing. That, that's my prefatory um, babbling uh, before you hear from the public, uh, and then I can come back and explain more about Great Land and what we've negotiated. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to open uh, the floor up to uh, public comment. If uh, anyone has any comment regarding the uh, Comcast franchise uh, changes or anything, uh, please come forward, uh, state your name and address, and... Uh, um, make your comments. Mayor, might I suggest as part of this, and as Bob thinks otherwise, is that uh, as you've opened the public hearing, and there may not have been anybody that steps forward, but we let him provide and put his report into the public hearing process, and then let anybody comment that hears uh, the contents of his recommendations, and then close the public hearing for then the council to interact and have discussion on the resolution and the supporting documents. Okay, that's fair. Sounds, sounds right. Yep. Okay, go ahead. I will continue to do something better than babble, I hope. Um, so, uh, prefatory remarks about how, how we're here, why we're here, and, and sort of the issues that are in front of you. We, as I said, have reviewed Great Land Connections. Great Land Connections, again, is a newly formed publicly traded company. It's a company that exists today within Comcast, but upon closing of the Comcast Time Warner merger will be spun off, will become an independent company uh, uh, of its own, publicly traded uh, and uh, separate from Comcast. So we've taken a look at Great Land Connections, and uh, to cut to the chase, Mayor and Council, we have some concerns about Great Land. And I will summarize very greatly the report that has now been introduced into the record about our concerns, sort of three concerns. One is that Great Land, although it's going to be a large publicly traded company, it's going to be magnitudes smaller than Comcast. 
It is going to have 2.5 million subscribers around the country, about 500,000 in Minnesota. That again is magnitude smaller than Comcast and, and more magnitude smaller than Comcast Time Warner. So it is a publicly traded but relatively small uh, cable operator. Notwithstanding that fact, it is taking on what is, at least to me, an awful lot of debt. It's going to have just short of $8 billion, with a B, dollars in debt on day one when it is spun off. Obviously, that amount of debt is, is a lot only in the context of how much earnings Great Land's going to generate. Maybe it's not a lot. If it's going to uh, generate enough earnings to support that debt, that's a perfectly appropriate amount. The concern, though, is about how we figure out the expected earnings for a company that does not exist or did not exist prior to creation recently by Comcast. It has no operating history. We can carve out the systems that are going to go into Great Land, and that's what the companies have done. That's the information they've provided. But then, of course, that begs the question, will Great Land operate like? Will it have operational costs that are similar to Comcast or very different from Comcast? And I'm not going to pretend that I'm something other than a lawyer. I'm not a financial advisor. Um, notwithstanding that fact, I am concerned about the way in which Great Land has represented its expected earnings relative to the amount of debt that it's taking on. I think there is a potential that it is taking on a large amount of debt relative to its earnings. So concern number one is that this company is going to be encumbered with a, a lot of debt. Number two is a related issue, and that is that Cable operators, their, their primary cost is the cost to buy the programming, the video programming that they turn around and sell. They buy that from the programmers that make the programming. That is, by a significant amount, their number one expense. Comcast, as the largest operator in the country, enjoys a volume, dis in effect, a volume discount on that programming. It buys programming cheaper than any other cable company in the country. Great Land, again, magnitude smaller, is going to buy programming for less of a discount for more money. That, of course, I, I don't need to say this out loud, but that, of course, will cause some upward rate pressure uh, on Great Land. It will have a higher uh, primary cost, the cost of programming, than it uh, would if it were uh, staying with Comcast. Third concern, last concern, is that, um, and I haven't said this yet, Great Land, this newly formed publicly traded company, is, this is a pejorative term, I don't mean it this way, but it is really, in a way, a shell company. It is going to be the structure of a cable company, but that company is going to be operated in large part under a contract with Charter Communications. Charter is another cable operator. Many of you may be familiar with uh, Charter. They do business in a lot of cities, other cities uh, around Minnesota. They're a relatively large cable operator. Great Land is going to be, in effect, operated by Charter under contract. That's well and good. The details, though, of what that's going to mean, if I'm a Comcast customer in New Prague, are, is unclear. They have not fully explained to us how that relationship is going to work. In fact, uh, to really uh, summarize it, they have not finalized the contract between Great Land and Charter, so I don't have a final contract that will explain how that relationship is going to work. So those are the primary concerns about Great Land, the legal, technical, financial qualifications of Great Land to be your, uh, one of your two franchisees um, in this city. What we've tried to do, and now I'm going to actually point you to a, a couple of pages in the report that's in front of you, what we've tried to do, and that's summarized on 14 and 15, is we've tried to address those concerns, those three areas of concern, via the two instruments that are in front of you tonight. One is a resolution that would approve the transfer from Comcast to Great Land with a number of conditions that I'm going to go through. That's one of the instruments. The other instrument is a settlement agreement, an agreement between this city and the current franchisee. The current franchisee is a subsidiary of Comcast. That settlement agreement provides some additional benefits to you. So again, remember I was talking about a franchise being a regulatory device and a contract that gives benefits. The kind of the marrying of those up is your resolution approving the transfer would impose some additional conditions to protect you and the customers here in this city. And the settlement agreement adds to the benefits that you receive under your franchise. So let's go through those quickly. The transfer resolution, uh, I'm not going to hit each one of the points you see on page 14. I'm going to hit the highlights. First of all, um, there is always an argument when a city approves the transfer of a cable franchise from one company to another, there is an argument that that meant that the city found there were no violations, there were no problems with performance. That's not true, typically. We haven't 
carefully evaluated whether Comcast is perfectly performing in this city or not. And so we make clear that we're not waiving any prior violations. We're not saying that uh, Comcast has been in compliance with your franchise. That's made uh, expressly clear. S second uh, point, and again, I'm pulling out the, the highlights. Second point is that the, the company, Greatland, the new holder of the franchise, would have to uh, sign a document that we've labeled a guarantee, a guarantee that has a specified form saying that it, Greatland, the corporate parent, the newly created cor corporate parent company, commits to providing sufficient capital to the local franchise holding entity, again, a subsidiary of Greatland, they commit to provide sufficient capital to that local entity to comply with your franchise and comply with applicable laws. That's an important guarantee. That is, in effect, a corporate level guarantee. You don't have that today. We have a commitment only from the Comcast subsidiary, not from Comcast, the parent entity. So that improves our relationship to the, the corporate parent. Third uh, thing I would point out, again, we've labeled it as a guarantee. Uh, Great Land guarantees that as a consequence of this transaction, which, by the way, I know I've made it sound like a very big transaction. It's actually a bigger transaction than what I've described to you. There's more tentacles out of this transaction. It's in a very expensive thing to do what Comcast and Charter and Greatland and several other companies are doing. And so there's a commitment from Greatland that the cost of all of these transactions won't be passed on to your consumers here. There won't be a rate increase as a result of the cost of the transaction. And then lastly, and this is kind of a repeat of my first point, and that is that Greatland itself, the corporate parent, uh, commits that it's responsible for all of the acts of its subsidiary, both going forward and retroactively. So Greatland, again, is in effect guaranteeing the performance of the local uh, franchise holder. That, those are the conditions, the highlight conditions out of the uh, proposed resolution that would approve the transfer uh, subject to those conditions. The next document start, starts at the bottom of page 14. It's labeled a settlement agreement. This, again, is the benefits uh, if you were to move forward at this transaction, the benefits that would accrue to you, the city, and to customers here. The first is um, purely procedural, uh, and that is that the, franch the Comcast franchise expires very shortly. We don't have a fully baked, completed, renewed franchise yet. I don't want to point fingers. It's not my tendency to do that, but I will tell you that Comcast has not been particularly, particularly focused on negotiating with uh, this city recently. They've been busy with <laughs> other things. Uh, and so it's been a little bit difficult to uh, get them at a table and, and work through renegotiating the franchise. The other thing that's complicating, of course, that you all appreciate is that the BevCom franchise needs to be almost identical to, substantively very similar to the Comcast franchise. And so we really have a three-way negotiation that has to be uh, completed, and so that also kind of slows, slows things down. So the first thing that would come out of the settlement agreement is an extension of our time to renegotiate the Comcast, soon to be potentially Great Land franchise, for a year, give us enough time to work through all of the issues and uh, have a fully uh, baked, proposed, renewed franchise. Second thing is that um, you have the right under your current franchises to be on TV. We see the the evidence of that in this uh, in the uh, school district boardroom, your meetings go out on the cable channel. I suspect other meetings and other programming go out on that channel. The second commitment is that to the extent we become ready as a city to put out programming in high definition, in a clearer, crisper quality format, we now have the right to do that. That was something that we would likely have been negotiating for in renewal. We've now secured that. Uh, through this settlement agreement, and that will, of course, find its way into any renewed franchise, I think both with uh, BevCom and with uh, Comcast. Third thing is that um, your channel, and I'm not certain yet whether we're going to ask for an additional channel or not in renewal of these franchises, but your one channel now uh, will have the right to be on the on-screen guide. Of course, you can find today all of your programming on the cable TV picture itself. That's, we don't use TV Guide anymore. We look right on the, the screen. Your channel will be now uh, on that guide, and you'll have some ability to indicate what programming is going to appear on that channel, and it will appear as a commercial channel or similar to a, a commercial channel on that guide. Fourth thing that you'll get, uh, and frankly, this was the focus of a lot of back and forth, and, and uh, um, Mike was very helpful on this point. Uh, we saw it, uh, given that you have two operators, uh, an obligation on Comcast to split the cost at some point in the future to get some equipment in your own house, in your own city hall chambers, 
so that in the future you'd have some flexibility about not holding meetings here and yet still being able to go on the cable TV channel. I'm not sure uh, about plans in that regard uh, in the short term, but at some point, obviously, you may want to have um, a separate home and still be on cable TV. And so we had proposed to split the cost of that equipment. Just to give you an idea, because I, I do a lot of this work with cities, to, to uh, fully equip a chambers like this, we're probably talking in the neighborhood of $100,000 in equipment um, uh, to make it happen. So we had proposed to Comcast splitting of that cost between uh, Comcast and BevCom and uh, uh, writing that into the settlement agreement. You can see that we've become a little soft on that. What we've said is we'll address that in a renewed franchise. There isn't really a commitment here under number four. It's just a commitment to negotiate that out uh, in a renewed franchise. And I will just tell you, um, inside baseball, no pun intended, uh, we, I had floated that with BevCom, and they have a little bit of concern about how that's going to be meted out on their bills, et cetera. And so there is an issue there of coordinating that sharing of cost between the companies. Uh, and so I think it makes sense to put that off for renewal of the franchises. Five, uh, within an, uh, a, a period of time not to exceed one year, uh, Comcast, soon potentially to be Greatland, will start remitting its franchise fee payments to you quarterly. Currently, they pay annually in arrears. They pay after the fact. That obviously is not the best way to proceed, and so uh, we have a commitment to get those uh, fees paid on a quarterly basis. Sixth thing is that uh, Comcast and BevCom are both committed to providing free uh, cable TV service to public institutional buildings in your city. This is a commitment that goes along with the fact that now that Comcast has put all of its programming in digital, digital uh, uh, format, one must have a box now. You didn't used to have to have a box to get cable. Now you got to have a box to get cable because it's d digitized. They commit now to provide up to three of those boxes without charge to each of the institutional sites where we're getting free service today. So there isn't going to be a new expense uh, associated with getting that free service. Seventh, um, the current uh, contract has insurance requirements, as I've talked about. They don't match the statutory limits. <laughs> On your liability, 1.5 million is the current limit, and so we'll up it to that. Uh, and then the eighth, uh, my time here tonight and uh, leading up to tonight will be reimbursed uh, by the company. So uh, that is the set of conditions and commitments we've negotiated. I will just say it's, it may not matter to you at all. It may matter to you a lot. This set of commitments is very, very similar to what many of the other local franchising authorities, cities, in the metropolitan area have negotiated with Comcast and with Greatland. Um, it frankly became almost a form negotiation, a form document set of, uh, of rights that um, the company was agreeing to that I became aware of through other clients. And so um, I, I could represent to you that you're not getting a less good deal than most of your sister franchising authorities in the metro. With that, um, unless you think of something, Mike, that I should be saying, I can stop and take questions. Probably more than they wanted in the first place. <laughs> well, but, uh, I apologize for that. <laughs> no, and I don't mean that from that standpoint. It's just understanding what's involved in this whole uh, transaction that uh, we were first notified, I believe it was last June or July, and it's now just finally getting to this point. And uh, as I said, we're one of the, the latter ones here of Bob's clients to, uh, to go through this process that uh, we just haven't risen to the level of uh, uh, their priority list as we'd like to. And so it's been very challenging to to try to get to this point to bring a document to you for your consideration. Okay, with that, uh, I guess I'll open the floor to, for any public comment. I guess if there is no public comment, I guess I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. We have a second by Dave Brujic. All in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye. Aye. Aye, any opposition? Okay, the public hearing is closed. Uh, so now, if, if anyone has any questions for Bob uh, in regarding uh, the franchise uh, document or what kind of action we need to take today, or I have a question for, I guess both Bob and Mike. Uh, in view of the fact that we really have no members of the public here, uh, and I would say that. Most, if not all of us sitting up here have really no experience with these things. I think that the letter or document that you wrote for us, Mr. Vose, is excellent. Just by reading this, I'd 
became more aware of everything that goes on. Mike, will this be available on our website? Sure. We someplace? Post, yeah, we could post on there to explain to the public what's occurring. I think that would be an excellent idea. That way, if people have questions, they can probably get most of them out here. If they have further questions, I would ask that you call Mike Johnson and not Bob Vose. <laughs> the only reason, because if you call Bob, we're going to get the bill. <laughs> maybe so. along those lines, maybe we could have Bob talk about, Bob, what do you expect to see based on this kind of process occurring? And again, because it's a, a new startup uh, with, with Great Land Connections, what can the consumer generally expect to see and under what timelines for those that have service, whether that be uh, internet and or cable TV with Comcast, what can you reasonably expect to see or where do you see this process going and impacting the local consumer? Yeah. Mayor and Council, that's a, that's a good question. I didn't touch on that. Um, there will be significant changes. If you're a Comcast customer, and of course we're only talking about video, there will be changes on the uh, internet and phone side of things that I can touch on. But on the video side of things, I think uh, eventually, I can't give you a hard date, but eventually the trucks that you see rolling around that say Comcast on them are going to say Great Land or Charter. Again, Charter is going to be uh, assisting in the operation of the system. The services which are now marketed, and it's really a branding thing primarily as Xfinity, Comcast's Xfinity video product, that's going to become uh, marketed the way Charter marks its service. Uh, it's going to change name. I think Charter's name is Spectrum Service. It's another branding uh, like Xfinity is. So you'll see that change. You'll see the name Charter on your video uh, screen when you bring up your guide um, or Greatland brought to you by Charter or something to that effect. Um, so you'll see um, those tangible changes. On the maybe more important to some people side of things, the internet and the phone side of things, good news, bad news. Uh, good news is you'll keep your telephone number, which is going to be really important, I think, to a lot of people. You'll, you'll keep your phone number despite the change in companies. Uh, you won't, though, keep your email address. Your email address now is um, at Comcast, uh, and so that will eventually change. As far as the timing of these kind of changes, this is an, a set of examples. I can't come up with the complete list of every change you're going to see, but along the lines of those kinds of changes, there is a transition agreement in place between Greatland and Comcast where Comcast services will continue to be in place after the closing, the spin-off day when Greatland becomes its own company and this system goes to Greatland. That transition agreement is for 18 months, but they've told me anecdotally that they're going to try and make that absolutely as short as possible, several months, three, four, five months. So I think the period of time after closing, and by the way, closing is anticipated within the next month. So I mean, it's coming pretty quick. Um, within the next month, closing, and then for three, four, five months after that, the products will all appear the same. They'll appear to be Comcast, after which they will change over to appear as Greatland or Charter by Greatland or something like that. So that's kind of the time frame that we're talking about. Um, longer term, um, I, it's speculative to talk about what's going to happen with Great Land, but there is a great deal of speculation going on in Wall Street and other places. Great Land uh, may well be acquired at some point in the future, and the Great Land part would go away, and it would just be the charter part of it. Um, there's an expectation that charter is interested eventually in purchasing Great Land. So that's speculative, and I don't know the timing on that, but the short-term timing is in the next three, four, five months, customers here will see a change the council's benefit what's happening on the federal front relative to this transaction that you can report on yeah mayor and council um the first thing again it's uh it's not easy to put your fingers on what i'm about to say but i will tell you that when this initially was announced when the biggest cable company in the country says it's going to buy the second biggest there's a, a sense of inevitability of that those are two big companies that thought it through a long time and their short shareholders voted to do it and it seemed inevitable that that was going to be approved Given some things that you may have heard about that the FCC is doing, um, deciding to regulate the Internet as a telephone service, as a utility, is the way it's been described, and bringing the Internet um, under that regulatory structure seems to some to be an indication that the FCC is not thrilled with the way this deal is moving forward. Comcast is a very, very large controller of the Internet. So uh, people are now talking about it's a 50-50 deal on whether it gets approved at the federal level. Regardless of that kind of uh, prognostication, 
there is going to be a decision by the federal government, one would expect, within the next certainly 60 days, maybe less than that, next 30 days, something like that. So um, the federal decision will be in relatively quickly, and the expectation is that the companies would close very shortly after that. If the federal government approves it? Correct. And if they don't approve it, then we just go back to square one? Yeah, Mayor and Council, I think uh, that's right. Um, but I think the more likely scenario, if you want to talk about sort of the parade of things that could happen, is that the federal government, the Department of Justice, the FCC, the SEC, uh, they could collectively impose enough conditions on the deal because any deal that gets approved here is going to have condition, federally imposed conditions apart from your resolution conditions. Um, it will have a lot of conditions on it. And I suppose there is some potential that the list of conditions would be such that the parties aren't willing to accept them and don't do the deal as a result, don't close. Um, I, don't, I have no sense for how likely that is. But there will certainly be significant conditions. And then to your point, Mayor and Council, um, if the deal doesn't happen, if Time Warner and, and Comcast don't merge, Great Land is not going to be spun off your system here and none of the systems in Minnesota are going to get assigned to Great Land. If that all happens, you will remain a Comcast-served uh, city and we'll have an extra year to work with Comcast or renewing its franchise. I guess as to the conditions, should you, uh, the, the will of the group tonight be to approve the resolution in the settlement agreement, the resolution only deals with the transfer. It imposes conditions on Comcast to Great Land. If that doesn't happen, obviously those conditions go away. The settlement, though, is with the current franchise holder, which is Comcast of Minnesota, Inc., a subsidiary of Comcast. Whether or not the deal happens, that settlement agreement will be valid and enforceable. So you'll get the benefit, if you vote tonight, yes, you'll get the benefit of the settlement agreement, the, the extension of time, the um, quarterly payment of franchise fees, et cetera, reimbursement of my expenses, et cetera. So you'll get those benefits regardless uh, whether the deal happens. How does Belcom play into this with their, obviously, their, uh, I think, a month behind? Yeah, they're like May of 2015, that. that. Yeah, Mayor and Council, I've um, had some conversations with their um, legal counsel, in-house legal counsel, um, and I've worked with uh, them and him before, and they're fine to work with. Um, I, we have not broached the subject of timing. I'm fairly confident despite the fact that I haven't broached that subject, that if you elect to extend your time with Comcast for a year by taking action tonight, and I go to BevCom and say, we have an extra year, how about an extra year with you? They're not going to be opposed to that. I think we'll get on the same timeline, in other words, uh, in working through the, the contract. That said, Mayor and Council, um, I have, with some um, degree of carefulness, gone through your current contracts. They're, they're pretty good franchises you have now. So I don't, I don't think we're looking to radically change your current contracts. I think we're looking to re-up them. Okay. I move to approve the enclosed resolution. Second. Okay, got a motion and a second. A motion by Mark Bartusz, second by Dave Bruschek. Any other further comments or questions for Bob? Huh? No, go ahead. <clears throat> so you're recommending that we do this? What we're about to do. <laughs> yes, Mayor and Council, I am, I am okay. recommending that. I mean, I think the other alternative, which is to say no, no to the transfer and not no to the settlement, um, the consequence of that is the companies will ignore it and close the transfer anyway, and you just won't get any of the benefits. So, yes. You. And you've negotiated with other cities on the same type of thing, and, 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 right. and they've all passed. That's I correct. Assume? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the council's benefit, could you just talk about who a few of those clients are that you've uh, sure. worked with on the Comcast uh, front? Yeah. Well, Mayor and Council, tomorrow night, um, not, you're not last. Tomorrow night is Burnsville, um, and the anticipation is that Burnsville will approve. Prior to that, um, City of Oak Grove up in northern Anoka County has approved, a client of mine. Uh, the Quad Cities, which is Anoka, Ramsey, Champlin, Andover, those four cities have approved. And then I know anecdotally from working in the business, um, Bloomington, St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis, uh, et cetera, um, have all approved. Okay. Any other comments or questions? So in simple terms, it doesn't pay to be the Lone Ranger trying to strike <laughs> out on some, uh, e even though all the terms and conditions aren't necessarily as desirable as we might like, and to have the change, we're really left with no choice in the process. 
And as he alluded to, the good side of it is we've got another cable provider that if in the end consumers don't like what they're, what they're receiving on that front, they have another choice to go to. Right. Where in many communities you don't. Okay, I have a uh, motion on the floor and a second. If there's no further comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Passes. Sure. And I, I apologize, it's belt and suspenders, but maybe a motion on the settlement agreement separately as well. Okay. Thank you. So that was the motion on the transfer. Uh, so then I guess I'll make a motion uh, to approve the settlement agreement. Second. Second by Pat Scripture. Uh, if there's no other further comment, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Passes. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you, if you hadn't done this a year and a half ago, Mike says, be prepared because he and the five of us were going to have to do all this. <laughs> and there's no way in hell I know how any of us could do it. Thank you. It wouldn't have gotten nope. done. Yeah. That was a very complicated, and you did a very good job explaining it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi to Scott for us. We'll do that. If he's ever in the office. I know he's probably on vacation again. I hear him over there occasionally. <laughs> okay, next on the agenda. We have uh, the Gulf Board proposal. If Wade and Tommy, you want to come forward? And You've had two tough acts to follow. Save the best till last, they say. <laughs> I think they'll still be a little shorter and sweeter. <laughs> I guess for sure. Okay, so um, at our past golf board meeting on Tuesday, uh, this past Tuesday, we uh, took up the um, discussion on capital improvements, specifically um, the uh, bond uh, monies for equipment for the golf course, and we approved three items totaling eighty three around the eighty three, eighty four thousand um, dollar level those three items were a turf mower uh, on the order of fifty nine thousand dollars or a rough mower excuse me um, the second item was a uh, equipment lift for the uh, maintenance shop and that was uh, that, that tallied around ten thousand dollars and the last piece of the puzzle was the uh, top dresser uh, and that was a $14,000 item and um, so this is a slight revision to our previously approved golf board amount of uh, $110,000 that was discussed and approved back in November December of 2014 um, we I guess we realized the, the City Council's uh, direction to narrow our focus and those are the three pieces of the puzzle that the golf board and Jeff, um, Jeff Pint being the superintendent, identified as you know essential items for the year 2015 to be uh, purchased, and so that was our discussion and our approval uh, last week. Uh, I noticed the. Um Rough mower is replacing an old piece of equipment. Is that being traded in, or is that? Uh, do you know if we're trading that in, or if we're going to keep that, and and just try to limp it along to you know be a backup? Do you know? I believe it's a five to six thousand dollar repair that's needed on that piece. It's worth right now thirty five hundred dollars. I'm not sure if he can um, trade it with the sale. I, I I don't know that that answer to that question. Okay. Right now, it's not usable unless it's repaired. It overheats. It's not usable. Okay. The intent would be to bid the uh, quotation such that we bid it both ways with and without a trade-in just to see what we can get for value and whether they would take it or not. Oh, okay. How old is it? It is uh, 11, 11 years. This Two, 2004 was, was the uh, purchase date there. It has a... Uh, a life oh, I see it there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. life expect expectancy <laughs> of ten years. So, uh, right, right there. The um, 
The uh, top dresser was purchased in 1984 with a life expectancy of 15 years, so we've uh, gone well beyond that useful lifespan there. Do we use that just on the tees and the greens? Is that the only spot, or do they use that? In? Typically. Yeah. Unless there's other areas, like we've had problems with water, if our tile system isn't running well, then he's in there with that equipment in those areas too, but typically just on greens. Okay. And so it's not something that would be used, let's say, when you just do a normal aeration on a fairway or anything? Correct. Okay. And I did ask about the equipment lift, if they could share that. And Jeff basically said by the time he went and got it and brought it back, it wouldn't, it would be too much hassle. Yeah, the one something one words to that effect. No, it's got to be mounted to it, the floor. It's essentially installed. bolted to the floor is what it is. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's not a mobile piece of equipment. And then I, I asked at the meeting too um, if um, Mike thought it would work with their finances. He said yes. He thought it was all workable. So. Well, it fits within. Uh, we included the uh, current uh, outstanding debt information uh, for your review. Uh, we've showed you what their annual principal interest payments are, um, and what what amount of that is technically left over or available. And you can see our preliminary uh, guesstimations on uh, uh, on financing this amount, not including issuance costs, and obviously putting it together with the CIP. Uh, Project for 15, the uh, consideration that you'd have at the next meeting on a street sweeper that Gr Glenn is bringing forward uh, with this obviously helps parlay and reduce the amount of issuance cost versus if it was going out on its own. Preliminary estimates from Terry Heaton and kind of running it preliminarily uh, with a low 2%, uh, 2.3% interest rate is about $9,400 in P&I. And so as you take a look at that previous page five, um, that would come off that uh, difference available for operations, uh, you know, that 9400 uh, 9, uh, Looking at the 15 uh, or 16 going ahead, as you can see, what amount that's left after the current transfer paying the uh, current debt picture. So that tells you what's available that the council can consider for that process. Would this just be a straight, um, you know, I noticed on some of the other uh, geo bonds that we did there was you know uh it was probably rear, just, rear probably end loaded just, yeah probably just a straight 10 year straight 10 years yep we've done uh, most of that uh, at this point and uh, as you can see we've already kind of back end leveled it and so we've got fairly level debt picture is what we tried to come up with in the past years with doing some of that so that debt is ranging uh, you know in that range of uh you know, the mid 80s, 85, uh, with one year up uh, 2021 up to about 91, but uh, the rest of the years is right in about the mid 80s or a little above mid 80s right now. So there's a little flexibility still remaining in that process, but uh, obviously we're reaching the tail end of that, uh, depending upon what's going to be spun off or produced from operations that would be available from a cash position. So you've got a little bit of flexibility left in that uh, transfer. Is there a any option of refinancing anything? No, all of these at this point, no, we've reviewed that with Terry. There's okay. nothing uh, uh, that's of any benefit to refinance. Okay. Any questions at all for Wade or? Tom's the engineer. He would know all this stuff. <laughs> I would Structural nominee. Stru yeah. <laughs> Just one minor thing to point out is that when the golf board was in front of you back in November is that... Uh, there was a request for, I believe, it was 105 or 110,000 in equipment to look at. Council didn't necessarily approve all of that. That you basically sent them back to the drawing board to take a look at that, which is why they went back and were re-examining that level of financing based on some of those improvements that you can see in the uh, debt uh, or the proposed uh, CIP that they've uh, submitted here this evening. So, council did not take final action in November. I think we questioned that work cart for one thing. Right. Yeah. One or two things we questioned. I just I just wanted to add to the um, on the equipment lift that Jeff was asking for. The one thing that kind of um, you know raised my eyebrow was that he said it you know it, it is with the amount of service that they do there at the shop 
that it is a safety issue where they're using, um, I don't want to say he said non-standard, but he said this equipment lift would provide a much safer environment for working below the, you know, heavy machinery, things that they have to put in the air. So to me, that, that was an important part of his contribution as far as why he needed you know, the equipment that he needs. Tom, is this lift, um, well, is the building or floor that this is going to be mounted to adequate to stabilize that machine? I don't know what the building is like, but it, it seems to me you need really? a fair amount of concrete. Sure. To uh, hold yeah, I'm, it. I'm assuming it's all floor mounted, and we wouldn't be mounting it to the to the the st overhead structure at all. But yeah, the actual shed is maybe 40 by 60. That's concrete floored and heated. The existing lift use they can use for golf carts and small equipment. This lift 2000. they'd be able to put all of their equipment on there and get it off the ground so it would it's safety and easier for them to you know do the mechanical work because they can use that lift for all the equipment now. Yeah I understand that what I was wondering though is the method of mounting it it has to be the equipment I understand is capable but is the flooring whatever supporting that thing key? Uh, solid something we'd probably have to look you'd at have to find a structural engineer right. probably to, yeah. to probably <laughs> i'm sure the way that works yeah <laughs> just you know just you know if, if we would know where one we could find one for a reasonable price uh, i'm <laughs> yeah. sure certain firms would yeah uh, I mean, no I, I, i'm sure dave uh, that that um the way that works i'm sure the manufacturer has specific requirements on slab thickness anchorage specific anchors and uh we've you know with the more recently built um, a building that uh, Wade noted, we would know if it's a four or six inch slab, and and all those items would be confirmed because, you know, they've got a they've got a liability warranty standpoint. I'm sure from a, a list standpoint, we'd be able to consult with Glenn as well. Right. Um, now that what sounded like a structural thing? engineer answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I have any? I don't. <laughs> I think without knowing the situation, I think the worst case scenario would be just from other things that we've mounted is they'd probably have to cut a hole in the floor. Sure, pour. Uh, dig pour out some up. sand and gravel, put actually like a footing down. Yeah. And, and then with the manufacturer's specifications right. as far as bolting and things like that. So okay. uh, again, without being involved, I don't think it's really a big issue. But it's a That's something question. we could do with our own staff? I believe we would be able to, yes. Okay. okay. They usually put a big enough pad on the base of those, cover enough area. Okay. Okay, any other questions? And uh, Pat, the, it was a unanimous decision. Okay. And I believe everybody was there, weren't they? Yeah. All seven members present. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I move we approve. Second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, I didn't get it out. Go ahead. <laughs> Motion by Mark Bartusha. Ten seconds. Second by Dave Brujic. If there's any other further comment, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? <coughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being so patient with us, too. <laughs> no problem. Very exciting stuff. <laughs> At this rate, there won't be anyone left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next on the agenda, Ken. This is, oh, this is a uh, variance. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we want a, the patty version. <laughs> right now. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Very quick PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you. We had a uh, request that was reviewed at the uh, Planning Commission meeting on uh, February 25th. You can see on the overhead here, uh, corner lot at 400 Lincoln Avenue North. Um, get your bearing there. Um, Move right along to the, the background. The applicant, Paul Tupi, is a property owner. Uh, he's proposing to remove the uh, single stall attached garage um, with a three stall attached garage uh, on that property. 
The specific variance request is actually uh, to vary from the 30-foot uh, minimum setback to the property line along 4th Street Northeast, which is actually on the south side of the property. Um, it's a variance of 11 feet to allow it to be 19 feet. At the meeting, we noted that uh, the house is actually uh, two feet closer than the current attached garage at 17 feet, and this garage, uh, as well as the existing garage, would continue to be at 19 feet from that property line, although it would be, would be larger. Uh, we did not have any public comments received um, at the Planning Commission meeting. Got a little bit of a zoomed-in view here for you. Um, again, the addition uh, would remove the existing uh, attached stall and the addition would be no closer to 4th Street and continue um, basically in this fashion. The next slide will show the actual addition here. You can see uh, the outline of the existing attached garage and then uh, the larger three stall addition. The red outline is the buildable area of the lot on uh, a corner lot, very narrow. Uh, not a whole lot of room to, to build. This is not uh, atypical of uh, homes built in the 1950s. We did not have a 30-foot setback to roadways at that point, which is the reason why you see the house and the garage uh, nowhere near that 30-foot setback being met. I was also noted at the Planning Commission meeting that if you look to the uh, west uh, of the property, all the homes down 4th Street are actually located um, slightly closer to the uh, road than the, the uh, proposed attached garage would be. So from a neighborhood uh, standpoint, there wouldn't be any uh, ill effect on that. It really does fit the neighborhood and what we've got going on there. Staff recommendation is um, to follow the Planning Commission's recommendation to approve the attached uh, variance uh, resolution. Uh, in your packet that allows the reduction from the 30-foot uh, setback to 19 feet to allow for the construction of that uh, three-stall attached garage at the uh, existing home at Lincoln, uh, 400 Lincoln Avenue North. A couple of quick photos here for you. Those, those trees are going to be removed? The trees will have to go unless they want a tree right in the front of the garage <laughs> um, there, but there is one behind it as well. You can kind of see it in the second picture here uh, that would definitely be in the way of the uh, attached garage. So yes, they pretty much will not have a tree left on, on the yard. Another view here. And the final slide. Uh, this is one of the homes uh, down the block to the west that you can see how close it is to the road. And this uh, attached garage would actually be a couple of feet further away from the, the property line than this particular home. That's all I have for the uh, staff report and would stand for any questions. Anyone have any questions? Okay, I guess I'll make a motion to approve the uh, variance. Second. Second. Yeah, second by Pat Scripture. Any other comments? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, that's 5 0. <coughs> Thank you, Ken. Next, uh, it looks like we have uh, the second reading of the uh, change to the exterior, exterior storage uh, ordinance. Uh, yeah, since you saw this at the February 17th meeting uh, for the amendments to the zoning ordinance for the exterior storage, uh, we have not made any changes. Um, I have not personally received any phone calls or feedback um, on the proposed amendment. Um, so I would uh, stand to propose the ordinance uh, again uh, to be uh, read and uh, recommend that it be adopted at tonight's meeting here. And do want to note that the actually the attached ordinance, the charter has changed and we can now simply have the ordinance take effect upon publication, which would be a next Thursday's paper rather than waiting a 30 day time period after the publication. So. Plus, we don't have to actually read it or dispense with the reading anymore. <laughs> that is correct, yes. <laughs> and that came effect of what, March 1st? Now, did, you 27th. See the, did you see oh, the 27th? it the 27th? We got our new book. Yeah, I saw the book. So, <laughs> awesome. Well, good. Any uh, comments? No. If not, I guess I'll look for a motion to approve the second reading. I'll approve the second reading of this ordinance. Got a motion by Dave Bruschek. Second. Second by Mark Bartuschik. 
to approve the second reading and under the new charter rules uh, we do not have to read the actual ordinance and it will become effective in the next publication which should be a week or this Thursday next a uh, week from this coming Thursday so okay. so all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposition okay passes 5-0 very good moving right along is this a second reading also Ken it's Mike's I believe this is Mike's <laughs> oh, yeah. oh that's right the chemical spray is Mike <laughs> I can handle it too but we'll let Mike take it <laughs> yeah, they this give me the easy one. ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, uh, this was reviewed by the council at the last meeting on, uh, uh, I believe it was the 17th of February. A uh, couple questions were raised concerning, uh, number one, whether the city should be named as an additional insured on the certificate of insurance. And the second part had to do with uh, the uh, time frame or time of application between April 15 and October 31. Uh, in reviewing both of those with Scott, uh, he doesn't feel that we need to be named as an additional insured. Uh, uh, he doesn't feel that we're really incurring additional liability for this and as such not recommending, i.e. when we do the uh, bonding and the insurance for a street project at uh, the size and level we do, uh, that that's really our contract for the work to be done with a private contractor. And so we're trying to make sure if anything happens to them that we're also additionally insured. So in his estimation, we did not need to be added to uh, that provision be added in here. And secondly, as we reviewed the time frame with him, um, it was his opinion that uh, we could just go ahead and take it out. Which you've done on the revised one, haven't you? Revised right? ordinance has yeah. it deleted, yes. Yep. So with those changes, is can it still be the second reading? Yep. Okay. <coughs> second reading incorporating those changes. Okay. So move. Go ahead, Amy. Second. <laughs> <laughs> got a motion by Mark Bartusch. No, I have a question. Oh, well, that's oh, you did. Because okay. that's good. We, yep, we got a motion and a second. Uh, any more questions, comments? So basically, I just want to clarify the basic purpose with the insurance is just to see that they have insurance because we won't be able to d really do anything with. Well, under what we're providing here, this is at an increased level from what they would have had just under the pure application li or the applicator's license that's approved by the state of Minnesota, that the the $1,000 bond that was there was basically Shelby trying to enforce uh, or having a provision there that uh, uh, that uh, they comply with the city regulations. Okay, so it's mainly just for the resident's protection that we know that that person has insurance. Correct. All right. they, they have some in order to get their license from the state of Minnesota, which we take into effect and make copies of when we get it, this gives them the abilities to, or we propose to increase that level under here, or they can still provide a $1,000 performance bond, either or alternative for them. All right, I just want to clarify that. I also have clarification. Now you took the date out of there, so, but it's going to be still an annual? Yes. Annual fee, so when they come in, Mary Jo has record that the last time they came in was, uh, yeah. right Mary Jo? All right. Well, I didn't provide the rest of it. This, this basically deals with the designated time of application, application. of the pesticide oh. lawn fertilizer is between blank and blank. Okay. And we typically haven't gone out to enforce other than as we take a look at it, as soon as we get these, we typically let Jim know, or if he finds or observes or somebody in the PD observes that somebody's out applying, is that periodically we stop and do a check to make sure that they've got a city license to be doing what they're doing. But here we're not going to wait and take a look at it, whether it's April 15th or whether they're all done on the 31st. Hopefully they're using good sense with the property owner as to when they're doing that. And in many cases, as we all know, that uh, the ground has to warm up to certain temperatures to begin applying some of those pre-emergence uh, in the first place. And personally, I don't know what drives the end of the October as to when they do their last application getting ready for winter. But uh, I've not had, in at least the time I've been here, anybody raise a question uh, or whether that's that time frame is applicable or appropriate or not and I don't know that we've had any complaints to PD that would raise the question so well, I'll we'll just keep you on speed dial when Doug Schenecker shows up and <laughs> no I'm just kidding. we're always available <laughs> <laughs> so I got a motion and a second uh, any other comments if not all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposition okay passes five zero 
Now, Ken, are you taking this one? I will. Okay. Yeah. As the council will recall during the budget preparation project for 2015, uh, in the building uh, department, uh, we had budgeted $49,000 in the capital line item, specifically for uh, what was identified per line item was 47,000 for new building uh, inspection software and another 2,000 for code books. We ended up coming under uh, budget in 2014 for our code books we had to order uh, last year and actually were able to acquire them all within uh, that budget so I freed up uh, the additional 2000 and 2015 and the reason I bring that up is um, as we uh, had brought a quote to you uh, for the uh, or quote uh, estimate for you for uh, budgeting purposes for this uh, new product product uh, it is a product from uh, Tyler Technologies which is who we have our current building uh, code software through uh, it is also our financial software that our accounting department uses for um, all of our accounting needs uh, within the city. Um, they acquired uh, this uh, software product called EnerGov within the past couple of years. And uh, it's a very, very much modernized uh, permitting uh, software that allows us to have an online portal for uh, customers to apply for and obtain permits online. Uh, Basically, at this point, what we intend to use it for is for uh, flat fee permits, such as uh, water heaters, uh, air conditioners, that type of thing that doesn't need a plan review. But it also will allow us to do plan review uh, fully online and um, get comments and feedback out where uh, schedules uh, for inspections can be made, et cetera, online. We will kind of phase that in with this software it also integrates with our mapping system um, as it relates to the nuisance complaint uh, component of it and what that would allow is uh, right now we have basically a form on our website that people can fill out and a lot of times you get people putting in the wrong address you know they don't know uh, exactly where they're complaining now that they will be able to pull up a map uh, on the customer portal uh, part, part of the website uh, click on a property uh, report you know a set standard of uh, violations or whatever it might be and uh, it would be a good, good tool for uh, us to help track those uh, nuisance complaints, whether it be long grass, et cetera, as well as uh, people can uh, keep track of their permits without necessarily having to call in continually. Have I gotten a final inspection on a permit? They'll be able to go into this uh, database right online and log in and find out a lot of that information on their own. It still requires us to obviously review and uh, approve all the permits, but um, it will be a very, very uh, convenient uh, item for a number of different people at, uh, particularly the permits, and Mary Jo knows all about this. We get a lot of permits that are mailed in that are the flat fee permits that could be handled online, and not to say that we don't enjoy processing those permits, but uh, it would speed up the process uh, infinitely. If, if would it then be separate. handled with a credit card? We handle uh, credit card transactions up to $1,500 currently. Over that, the fees are pretty much cost prohibitive to provide that service. But yes, it would be uh, handled through credit card. So those, those pretty, uh, they're probably not that expensive. Those water heater type deals and, and so under everything would be just, typically, for and that would be just handled, you know, with a credit card and, and type of thing. Correct. Um, and this does interface with our web site. It would interface, uh, if you've been on our utility billing website, this would set up a similar uh, payment website. You try to have it essentially mimic your uh, city website and create a logger, uh, login, username, et cetera. Um, haven't quite worked out if it would integrate with the same uh, login information as utility billing, although it would be the same uh, provider, obviously, Tyler Technologies. So those details we'll have to work out, but yes, it would. <coughs> It would uh, integrate very much the same way for payments. We already approved this in the budget process. We did right? approve in the budget, yeah. and um, he's just asking for the two thousand more. Essentially, yes. we hope to not have to use that. Um, they have conservatively estimated uh, data conversion and assistance fees, which are by and uh, large uh, the uh, bulk of the cost of this software. If you look on the quote, the actual license fees, which are a solid number of $10,927, uh, it's the other fees that are kind of the unknown. We don't have a whole lot of data. They, they work with a, a lot larger cities than, than uh, New Prague, for example. Uh, we believe uh, with our data that we already have, obviously, in our system that uh, 
we won't have to go through the full two weeks of conversion and, and training as they've noted here. But nevertheless, that's what they have included in here. But we do believe it would come in down that they only bill actual expenses uh, based on the work that they have done. Um, note in here as well as we talked at the time of budgeting, we, we did receive a discount on this software uh, for possible future consideration if uh, the council and staff uh, potentially move forward with uh, proposing uh, other online uh, services to be uh, done in the future, such as licensing management, which would could be potentially liquor licenses done online, dog licenses, that type of thing. Um, and then uh, Glenn and Bruce have sat through a demo on the same uh, software for, it's called the Public Works module, and again uses the mapping uh, to report outages, communicate back out with residents if you know, water main breaks and whatever it ties in with our database from utility billing. Um, you could have a phone call automated, email, whatever. So that was kind of future and we'd really play, play into that, that, you know, we could potentially buy that so they could get this initial uh, investment uh, down a little bit. So uh, looking for your authorization to approve the purchase uh, in the amount of the <coughs> quote here dated. Again, it's an estimate. Uh, for a more majority of the fees, we do believe it would come in under the 49000 uh, even though right now it's about 5189 uh, which is a bit over budget, but uh, we do firmly believe we'll, we'll have that uh, under that uh, capital line item amount. But if it doesn't, do you have something in your budget you could? May have to come back in front of you, but I would not anticipate that, that being uh, needed at all. What is the time frame? <coughs> They have a fairly lengthy time frame here, about a four month time period. Okay. To, and basically that's from beginning, they do a lot of uh, forms that we have to fill out, uh, almost like a interview, so to say, that they go over all the data that we have. And they're familiar with our uh, uh, building code software that we have currently. And it's just a lot of integration with uh, all the files we already have scanned into our system to make sure that that transitions effectively. So it could be less than that, but they say it kind of on the outer range, a four month time period to get that all done. Most of it's the upfront work. The training, like I said, is about a two week time period to implement and get that running online. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I guess I'll look for a motion to approve the new software for Tyler. So moved. Got a motion by Pat Scripture. Second. Second by Dave Brujic. There's no other further comment. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Next, Mike. I assume you're taking this one? Uh, yes. In close for your review tonight is a recommendation from the New Prague EDA on the purchase of uh, a real estate purchase agreement with uh, Randy and Lisa Marie uh, Kubish uh, for the proposed acquisition of 23.52 acres of land adjacent to 6th Street Northwest, the north side, and adjacent to and west of uh, Highway 21. Uh, EDA met this morning to uh, confirm uh, their recommendation and uh, voted unanimously to recommend to the council tonight uh, this acquisition. The purpose is, obviously, as we've been working on for a number of years, is to facilitate the creation and development of the second phase of the city's industrial park, which was originally done in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And I went back just as a prelude to take a look at some of that information that uh, uh, took a look at that first industrial park that the city was involved in. And I believe it was in about June of 2012 in the materials that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we provided to the EDA and ultimately shared with the council. I went back to take a look at just to kind of recap and take a look at what's happened on the south side of 6th Street Northwest. And as I went back to take a look at that from a tax base creation and jobs that uh, have been created is that there's 14 parcels uh, of land in the industrial park, two of which are currently in use for public purposes, the, the water tower and the electrical substation, but there's about 15 businesses operating on the south side of uh, 6th Street Northwest Extended. The tax base that was created, and this hasn't been updated since then, but back in uh, that time frame, we were looking at 2012 property tax uh, values and data of those 15 businesses that were operating in the industrial park on those on 12 of the parcels, they were generating between the city, the county, and the school 
just under $192,000 in tax base annually as taxes being paid. And specifically, the piece that came to the city was a little over 51%, or just under $99,000 in tax revenues coming to the city of New Prague. <coughs> On the job side of it, uh, there were 149 jobs that uh, were full-time jobs out there in those businesses and another 62 part-time. So I give you that as a premise and kind of a bit of a background as to why is the city looking at this in the consideration of the recommendation from EDA. Purchase price is as shown in the, the memo at $1.45 million, uh, or a little over $61,000 an acre. Uh, it's adjacent to 6th Street. Uh, the piece that's a little different than in most pieces that we might buy for industrial purposes, this one already has city water, sanitary sewer, storm sewer, and street adjacent to the site. And so when you take a look at that, there's a value in that purchase price that we're paying where that infrastructure has already been installed by the city and does not need to be added in order to begin to plat and begin development of this property. Next steps following their recommendation for acquisition tonight obviously would require the initiation of the annexation uh, with Helena Township, the preparation of the property for platting, and then uh, lastly, the negotiation with the Rural Electric Association, MVEC, uh, to ultimately serve that property for electrical purposes. Uh, at this point, I can't predict how that's going to go, but we've been in conversation with our utilities uh, uh, board and in indicating that this is one of the next steps, assuming you take the action tonight, uh, that will require us to uh, interact with uh, representatives of MVEC. Uh, uh, we have a representative in the audience tonight, and we had one at the EDA meeting, and they've been coming to most of the EDA utility board and council meetings where this topic uh, has been uh, discussed. This project uh, has been in the works since the fall of 2010. We didn't start yesterday. We didn't start a year ago. We started a little over four years ago to take a look at this. This was a recommendation that came from the EDA. Council concurred, and so they've been working diligently since then to begin to try to put the community in a position to consider this to make the choice on, on what to do. We've been able to obtain about $43,000 in financial assistance in uh, three of the last four years to undertake a number of the uh, engineering, planning, uh, financial, uh, market analysis, uh, survey, environmental review, wetland delineation, um, and traffic studies in preparation for getting this uh, in front of you. So in taking a look at that, uh, uh, there's been an awful lot of work that's been done to date that normally if they were bringing a real estate contract to you would be conditioned upon getting those things done but the work that they have done uh, has already taken care of most of those elements. So in the purchase agreement, it's a relatively clean agreement uh, with the hope uh, of closing on or before April 15th with your approval. The expectations in starting that process, again, not knowing exactly how things might proceed on the electrical front, front uh, from a platting and annexation process, it's our hope that uh, uh, we could conceivably have this work undertaken and done by some time uh, yet this fall uh, is, is our hope and belief. Uh, obviously the first step is annexation working with, uh, and we have a representative from Helena Township in the audience tonight as well, taking a look at getting that done and through the state of Minnesota, and then bringing the platting process uh, for the, the development and the layout of the property uh, back in front of the Planning Commission and you as a council to ultimately sign off on that. So we've got some work ahead. We've not uh, put those wheels in motion as of yet, but those would be the uh, logical next steps uh, in the process. So in addition to the purchase contract that we have in front of you, uh, we've shown you a conceptual layout uh, uh, of the property uh, in your packet. As I indicated, the total acreage is uh, 23.52 acres. Uh, in the conceptual layout, we're looking at upwards of about nine different lots, uh, ranging in size from two to a little over uh, three acres. Uh, we're not proposing to put in the public improvements for either 8th Avenue Northwest or 6th Avenue Northwest Extended. Uh, the intent would be to wait and see from a development perspective uh, what kind of needs or wants or desires come to the table. And based on what might be done as far as the job creation, what gets built, we may be able to go to the state of Minnesota and do, to get assistance and funding for the installation of those streets and or infrastructure, or at least a part of that funding. And so. Uh, in this recommendation uh, and what you look at from a development standpoint, 
Uh, those are not being included at this point in time. If we ultimately had to do it, it could be done in conjunction with the city's annual CIP projects as well uh, to take a look at uh, doing that. The uh, estimates for the development that are included in your packet uh, and that we've provided um, show you the purchase price of the, uh, uh, the land, that being $1.45 million. Uh, we've got to do uh, probably some legal work and prorating property taxes to date of possession, uh, which would conclude the, uh, the land closing. Uh, development costs are the costs identified by Ken. In fact, there's a map for you kind of showing you how that would conceptually lay out, and we have uh, utility availability all along the southern side of that site, which makes it uh, you know, a real logical piece to take a look at for this process. But as I indicated, after the land acquisition, development costs are estimated at 102. Uh, we've already spent about uh, uh, that 43,000 that we would have had to have incurred uh, going forward. We've already gotten that in the form of grants from the Scott County CDA, so that's been very helpful. So when you add the acquisition, uh, the development costs, and a contingency, we're estimating a project of a little over $1.6 million, coupled with the uh, revenue sources that we have attached below that. Uh, we've also included a recommendation uh, or basically an outline of uh, trying to take a look at when we had previous discussions, whether we pay cash for this, whether we bond for some of it, uh, and reviewing that with our financial advisor, Terry Heaton from Springstead, uh, uh, we've determined there, there's no major benefit at this point based on uh, the low cost of uh, debt issuance plus uh, minimal interest earnings on uh, funding to incur that. We debated about whether we did any kind of shift of the funds and moved it and opened up additional taxation, but in the end decided that as we took a look at it in our overall recommendation that it uh, was far more beneficial to, uh, to use cash on hand. She's recommending that we uh, consider the adoption of... Uh, uh, of a resolution within the next 60 days to intend to reimburse ourselves when, when and if we can from land sales or potentially through some possible use of a tax abatement if it ever became necessary down the road. And so we'll explore those pieces and uh, be coming back to you based on our discussion uh, with her on those materials. But uh, EDA uh, in their review this morning uh, committed uh, uh, their funding uh, out of funds that they have on hand to apply towards this project and are uh, recommending approval of the uh, uh, project uh, and the real estate agreement with the Kubishes for your consideration here this evening. Any questions, comments? It's been a long time coming. Yes, uh, I, know. I know. I think it started shortly after I got elected and I've been on the EDA board working on it ever since. So I do. You know, and I guess I'd like to make one comment. I mean, you're not going to see the days of developers coming in and developing land nowadays is is not just happening. So uh, I think this is really, uh, you know, a piece of property, like Mike said, has already have uh, a lot of the infrastructure there already. Uh, so basically it would be considered shovel ready, uh, which once we get through some of the uh, steps of uh, annex it and uh, some of the other issues resolved, you know, we can, uh, you know, put this on the first stop shop uh, website, uh, shovel ready land available in New Prague and uh, start marketing uh, the property. Well, you can see in the purchase agreement under exhibit B that uh, uh, there are no outstanding assessments that uh, we kept that as a, that was a cost allocation. And I mentioned that in my memo that uh, the city through various projects were constructed in 1994, 2000 and 2003 installed all the streets and the utilities going back in that time frame. And when you look at that, they basically positioned us to take a look at this land on the north side. Uh, we have the abilities as an EDA to operate this uh, property uh, in a tax exempt capacity uh, for up to 15 years as an industrial park. However, if we choose to cash rent the property, uh, the property is taxable, uh, but I think there will be more from more than sufficient revenues uh, that can be obtained in renting the property on an interim basis until we get ready to sell or whatnot, that uh, through cash rent that we can more than uh, pay the uh, taxes and insurance on the property to, to cover that cost. So there shouldn't be any out-of-pocket negative uh, impact to the city from that respect. Uh, I also tried to highlight to you when you take a look at that the city had by undertaking the road improvements and the utility extensions, when you look at the business development that has occurred on the south side of that road, I thought it was imperative in going back to take a look at this as 
you know, why we do this. We as city government, we don't create jobs. We don't create tax base. All we can do is help facilitate the opportunities for that to occur in the community. About 24 to 25 percent of our community tax base is commercial, industrial, and about 67 percent is residential. So moving into this arena in these lots of this two acre to a little over three acres, uh, we're not out chasing the chart expansion opportunities uh, uh, that we're dealing with uh, relatively smaller com or smaller industrial type development based on what has historically been uh, developed out in that area. But uh, when you look at the job uh, numbers that have been created out there, the tax base that's been created, I think it has proven that the city was wise in getting into that a number of years ago. And so now this is the second opportunity that you as a council and community have to do this. Okay. I was uh, glad to see the letter from Springstead, uh, Terry Eaton, and uh, read that, that everything's good to go with them. I'm glad uh, we to try to, whether that. it's the baseball project, whether it's the industrial project, whether it's any other bonding or those kind of things, is we try to take a look at what those financial implications are and look it down the road and doing our forecasting and planning to try to make sure we head off any of those problems before they occur. Uh, will we be able to do take care of all of them? No, there's going to be unforeseen things that come up that we can't anticipate, but we try to minimize uh, any negative outcomes or the majority of those things uh, from occurring as best we can. That comment was very similar in uh, at EDA, too. That, was that, it? that letter was very uh, yes. forthcoming, and it was yeah, very... Because I was kind of wondering, you know, like, oh, you know, yeah. how is that going to affect our bond rating? I don't know. Yep. Oh. No, I thought it was a very good letter. So any other questions for Mike? I have one um, for the uh, so will we you will staff or and Springstead be preparing a reimbursement resolution or we'll be considering that once it's yeah, we'll, after the the 60 days from the from the sale yeah, date disperse. yeah we'll be working to put that together as well as the the other program that uh, Terry mentioned I told EDA this morning I've not been through anything other than the tax abatement we did for chart and she's just proposing that that's a kind of a, a preservation capability that should we uh, underestimate things uh, or not uh, plan for certain things, it's a tool that could be used on the road. And so it's only a planning tool, not that we're necessarily going to use it or ever implement it, but it's just a, a backup security feature that we can add to this. But uh, the intent would be to, to adopt that resolution and preserving that ability, just again, giving us the greatest flexibility and security long term as best we can that way. Okay. Any other comments? If not, I guess I'll make a motion to approve the, the purchase of the real estate. Second. Second by Mark Bartuschik. If there's no other further comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Wow, we can cross that one off the bucket list. I well, know the work's just beginning. <laughs> well, your work's just beginning. I was just thinking that everybody's going to be working. Next on the agenda, liquor license. Uh, the only question I have is, with this note that we received from Caroline, uh, is she still requesting a permit? The answer is yes. We've gone through a couple of different processes uh, with her. Uh, we questioned it here again when all the materials were submitted. Um, she wants to know that she has that in place, that should she sell it, that there's a license applicable to the, to the building and the property. We've been telling her for four years that she hasn't needed it, but she's wanted to pay for it, and she's done it annually. Uh, originally, she was not going to. Then they came back and submitted all the materials. I phone verified with the attorney that, yes, in fact, that she wanted to do that, and the answer was yes. And we have no outstanding ones this year. They're all, there's not some that are going to pay late. Uh, we have one that has not applied as of yet. We're not certain that they're going to reapply, but... Uh, there's only one uh, that would be for the chameleon. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it's here. I'll make a motion to um, approve the 2015-16 liquor, beer, wine, and miscellaneous license. Second. ET item is for sale. But it, yeah. Discussion? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, I got a motion by Pat Scripture. Second, uh, was it Dave? Yeah. Second by Dave Brujic. Uh, any other comments? Clarification on what Mark was asking is desperate measures karaoke doing business as JTs. Right, yeah. he. They he, are doing business here? Yeah. They've applied and paid for the license. So it's open. Which they are currently open about? at the present time, and they've applied for their new license effective April 1st. 
Who are you talking about? A.T. Hideaway. Hideaways. Karaoke. Okay, so I have a motion and a second. Any other further questions or comments? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. The and, liquor and license so just so you know that to make the list, uh, they have to have paid their application fee, their property taxes are current, mm -hmm. all utility bills are current, and there's no other outstanding issues uh, from a licensee standpoint uh, that Jim hasn't uncovered. So okay. Just so everybody knows, this is the first year that everybody is paid. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have any real estate this issues. This is my seventh year. <laughs> this is the first year they've all been paid on time. I guess bar, bar, bar business is good. <laughs> Next on the agenda, consent agenda. Anyone have any questions, <clears throat> issues uh, regarding anything in the consent agenda? If not, I guess I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. So move. Or, yeah, second. Second, second by Mark Bartuschik. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Now we're on the miscellaneous. Jim, you have anything? I do not. Okay, Glenn. I've got nothing. You got nothing except you got to go home and get some sleep because the that, snow's going to start falling about I'm four in the morning. Do. Yep. Okay. Ken. Uh, nothing. All right. Patrick. How come you were late today? I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Traffic was bad in the street. <laughs> Couldn't find a parking place because all those baseball guys were here, right? Oh, it's probably. I'm just jerking your. <laughs> just jerking your chain, Patrick. Mary Jo? Michael? Uh, Thursday, Amy and I will be gone. We'll be going to the League Legislative Conference. So we'll be up in St. Paul for uh, part of Thursday. And then I think, uh, Chuck, you and David, uh, and if I get back in time, I'll join you going to uh, to uh, the LeSueur County officials meeting. Okay. And just information on that meeting, that's going to be kind of like a, a workshop, uh, kind of looking at how to promote LeSueur County uh, type of thing. So that's really, it's, there's not a topic or it's more like a workshop. And uh, I don't know if, Ken, do we have any material um, you know, marketing material that we have, any brochures about New Prague that I can take? We have our park brochure, and... I mean, I do have, you know, That's a couple of the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have a couple of the Scott County things. Yeah, and, and that. Uh, maybe the Source magazine uh, from the Times. Yeah. Other than that. Do we have a copy? School has yeah. a one. Uh, we've got a few copies at City. Yeah. Really. Chuck, oh. I was planning to stop at the chamber and get the materials that they have there. Okay put that yeah. package yeah, together for they, us. Yeah, the school has a nice one I saw the other day. Okay. You have a good That's one. That's all a big part of New Prague. Yep. Okay. Yes, I plan to go, Dave. I'll, I'll email you and I can pick you up. Or is it up or Marcia? Mike, do something. Okay. Pat, you got anything under miscellaneous? Do not. Okay. David? What's with the armory? Any, any decision? Um, I haven't had a chance to place a follow-up phone call, but the last I had checked is... Uh, the gentleman out of the Chicago region was going to be submitting a report to uh, uh, his boss out in Boston. I just haven't had a chance to call in the last week. I'll get that Been call. Been busy, have you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't really want me to answer that, do you? <laughs> he hasn't done. No. And Mike, uh, was he was too busy. Even He apologized to me about not being able to get his weekly update. So I told him, forget about last week. No and time for that even. <laughs> just, oh. If he can put one together this week, it would be fine. So... Amy, anything? No. Mark? Nope. I do not. Okay. I thought surely, Pat, you'd met, oh, you did to mention the, the charter booklet. Uh, yep. We had that oh, done and ready to I go. Did the, the uh, we only printed 100 of them uh, just because we're going to get it put in the, uh, uh, on the website with the, the updated city code, and so we felt it was more appropriate to put it there than to uh, invest oh, in all those. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Should we adjourn first and then go into yes. closed session? Okay, I guess I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you by Pat Scripture. All in favor and adjournment. Going to special closed session. Say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Are we supposed to okay this?